two, one. What's up, buddy? How's it going, man? Dude, it's so cool to have you here. I'm excited. I'm I've excited. been I've been looking forward to this. I fucking love your shirt. Thank you. Thank you. I've never seen that Plink Floyd shirt before. Yeah. Um. So like really randomly, like Pink Floyd favorite band of all time. Um. I like collect vintage T-shirts, so I'm like close to like having the full collection. I'm like three away, and That's I recently got sick. this one. I love this. That's fucking sick. So how many Pink Floyd shirts in total do you have? 26 holy like, fuck. all from before 2000 okay so what got you into collecting vintage shit because you have a whole <laughs> page dedicated to I it do, yeah. and i fucking love it yeah uh, cheers by the way oh yeah of course cheers pleasure to have you man <clears throat> so uh really random um i started college in oregon state uh, I originally went to go play tennis there. Uh, didn't work out. So I was like, sure, why not? I'll hang out. You're built like a fucking tennis player. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I uh, was at the gym one day and I ran into a friend from freshman year who I hadn't seen in a while. He's like, oh, dude, we should hang out today. I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to drive down to Portland and uh, go shop for new clothes. He goes, oh, how much money you got? I'm like, oh, like a couple hundred bucks. He's like, I actually sell clothes out of my garage. They're old vintage shirts um, he's, and like pants and stuff like that. And he's like, honestly, come through. You'll probably spend half of what you'd spend down there. You'll get way cooler stuff. And I'm like, all right, why not? That's, so, a, that's a good friend. Yeah. Uh, so I went in there. I bought like 20 shirts from him, a couple pairs of pants, jackets. Spent like 200 bucks for like 50 different items of clothing. And I bought a Pink Floyd shirt and a Slipknot shirt off him. Nice. And I was just kind of obsessed. I was like, these are so cool. They're old. There's history behind them. And then slowly I like started looking into it more and found uh, like this one Pink Floyd shirt. Should have worn it. But uh, it's from the 1994 Division Bell Tour when they came to the U.S. And uh, I was like, I need this one day. And then I started thrifting, doing all this kind of stuff, and then kind of became a big part of my life thrift for hours a day just scrolling through ebay watching instagram lives stuff like that just figuring out the market stuff like that which is really complex and kind of stupid in its own just because it's a seller's market like somebody yeah. can find a random shirt that's just not really listed and it's like oh this is seven hundred dollars or you can find one's like it's five bucks so right yeah um that's kind of what i got my start in uh and then you know i grew up listening to pink floyd they were like my favorite band ever and so i was like this is what I want to do. I think their designs are dope. Their uh, artist, uh, Thorgensen, he's from Iceland. He just has the most weird psychedelic artwork, and it's just like, I was obsessed with it. So That's fucking sick. They don't make shirts like that no. anymore for bands. They do not. What I, what I really, and I'm, I'm guilty of it because I have a lot of shirts like it, but there are, like, <clears throat> I haven't gone so much anymore, but like, Really, the only place to get band tees, unless you're all going online, is like Hot Topic or Spencer's. Yeah. And they all have the same format, where mm -hmm. it's a stock shirt with a picture that's about that big. Exactly. And like I found this at Hot Topic, and I was shocked. It's like, what's what's a full print yeah. for the same price doing it at Hot Topic? That makes no fucking sense. So like on that topic, I have Major Beef, also most of the vintage community does, with uh, Urban Outfitters. So what they've started doing is like they are buying uh, like the rights from old bands on their artwork. Oh no! And so like for example, there forever there was this T-shirt in the business community that's just been one of the biggest ones forever. Super expensive. It's, Keep uh, going. I'm just gonna check the camera. Oh yeah, you're good. Um, so yeah, it was uh, the Nirvana heart shape box shirt. So it's like uh, all over print, crazy. Um, and Nirvana bought the rights to it and just started reprinting it. So, like, now there's just tons of, like, modern ones out there. And before, like, you know, there's these niche where, like, you never see these shirts. And, like, at least to somebody who, like, has an eye for it, I'm like, damn, that's that's crazy. Like, you never see something like that. Um, so, I really don't like that. Just in the sense of, like, I prefer the original because there's history behind it. Like, most of these shirts were sold at concerts or... And what are they getting priced at? Is it ridiculous pricing for it, well, too? It's Urban Outfitters, so, like, no. But it's still, like, $40 for a T-shirt. Yeah. Where, in reality, like, in my personal opinion, a regular T-shirt that's not, like, something crazy should be 
I'm proud to announce that the podcast is now officially sponsored by the fine people over at Chop Chili Company. Guys, this is some of the best chili you can get here in the state of New Mexico, and they are online as well as in stores. They can be found at Smith's, Albertson's, Sprouts, John Brooks, and Lowe's Corner Market. They have three amazing flavors that you see here, and they also have frozen green chili that you can get online. Go on over to the website, chopchilico.com, and get yourself some amazing chili today. I mean, same. I see, because that's what kills me too is like, so one of my favorite bands, if you can't tell, is fucking Ice Nine Kills. Mm -hmm. I fucking love that. I was recently introduced to them. Yeah. Amazing. I've seen them in the last year, I've seen them three times. Oh, hell yeah. Because they, I don't know how they they did it, but they came last October with Slipknot, funny enough, Mm -hmm. on the road show. Then they came back two months later. To Rio, to Rio Rancho, and they were on the Trinity of Terror with uh, Mostless and White, and um, oh, there's one more on there. It was a Treyu, but there's another big one on there. Oh fuck! <laughs> I completely forget. It, it was Mostless and White, Ice Nine Kills. I was supposed to go to that show, I and that. <laughs> uh, mm, that's gonna kill me. I forget who the last band was, but anyway, it'll come to you. Yeah. Anyway, so I saw them then. And then I just saw them last week or two weekends ago. Okay. And my issue with like buying their merch, like I love supporting the bands. It goes directly to them. Partially. For like for the most part, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like on their website and shit. Mm-hmm. But like it's so fucking expensive. It's ridiculous. Like they they do they do drops the ninth of every month. And like one t shirt's thirty five dollars. Exactly. And then you add tax and shipping, it knocks up to forty two. I'm like, I can't like Especially now that the economy is getting worse, mm-hmm. I cannot justify forty two dollars for a fucking shirt. Hundred percent, and that's half the reason. Like, I love going to their show is I'm going to get exclusive merch at the show. But yet those shirts are so and they're expensive. so fucking expensive. But what I like about it is the the prices there are the same online. It's like okay, I'm saving like ten bucks, eight bucks because not doing it with tax and shipping. But even like like if I didn't get a bonus from work, literally the day before the concert. Mm-hmm. Probably not. <laughs> I probably wouldn't like. I wouldn't have bought a sweater. Like yeah. the sweater that I got is fucking sick, but it was seventy dollars. Well, seventy so, bucks. Like, I just went to uh, what, like a month ago uh, to Smashing Pumpkins when they were in town. Oh shit! Uh, yeah. How was that? Um, like again, a band I grew up listening to. I love them, and like some of their originals were amazing. Yeah. And other songs are just kind of ruined for me now, just because they're so old. Yeah. But like at the same time, it was great. But I remember they had um, a shirt, and I was like, "Oh, that's cool!" Like uh, I'd be down, and I like kind of walked up to it. I was like, "Damn, they're selling the shirt for fifty five dollars like, at the venue." I'm hell no. That's a that's fucking steep. But I mean, the, the thing about like these kind of shirts and like I mostly exclusively do band t-shirts or just things like from my childhood yeah things that have meaning to me it's just like it's a memory right like you know I'm gonna put on the shirt and I'm gonna be like oh I remember going to Smashing Pumpkins like yeah remember hearing these songs live for the first time and seeing like just how amazing the atmosphere was there and stuff like that but yet it's just a strange concept of like them trying to not not necessarily the band themselves, but the people selling the shirts and producing, just trying to kick up the price for something that honestly costs them like a dollar fifty to make. No, for real. And what blows my mind is the idea of venues. Like I was having this conversation with uh, this guy named Alex. He's a drummer for a local uh, deathcore band okay. called Inhuman Hands, fucking killer band. Um. We were talking about how uh, venues, some venues will take a cut of merch sales. And Most shows. do. And that makes zero sense to me. Yeah. That makes, because what what did the venue do to contribute to the merch? And then the other thing is like the employees who are selling these are like, don't work for the company. Like, for example, like in town, like at Isleta, everybody you see selling merch, selling beers, selling stuff like that are people who are, they li- are literally like hiring for a day. And just yeah. paying them for like, so it's not going to anybody but the bands and like the people producing it, and it's like it's well, a good way to make money, but like it's just it's so fucked. Yeah. It's fucked. And then like, so I went to Sunshine two weeks ago, I think. Yeah, I think two two three weeks ago to see. No, it was the same week I saw Ice Nine Kills. I saw Bless the Fall when mm-hmm. they came through, 
And the bands that were with them, like um, uh, Kingdom of Giants and Dragged Under, mm. the people selling the merch at the table were the band members. <laughs> yeah. They were literally the fucking band members. It was funny. The guy, really nice guy. I met him like we were both uh, getting liquor. And I met him in line because I had seen his table and his table said, be right back playing guitar. <laughs> and so I met him in line. I was like, are you really selling merch? Like, yeah, I'll be there in a bit. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah, that's the uh, same thing I had with, uh, I know, you know, they got, uh, they got some side Montero. Yeah. So I had met Jaron previously. And I remember I pulled up to one of their shows because uh, their drummer, Levi, uh, we had had a bunch of classes together in college and became kind of close. And uh, I remember going up, I'm like, are you, are you selling merch for your own band? I understand, like, time maybe they're a little smaller and stuff like that. But I was just like, you know, I respect that, like, most bands like that were, like, committed like that. A good example of that is, like, when Nirvana was just starting. Like, you know, Kurt Cobain was selling T-shirts. Yeah. Like, selling stickers, stuff like that. And... Again, just going back to the topic of, like, this kind of stuff is history. Like, there's memories behind it. It's just something very, at least to me personally, something very special about it, especially as somebody who, like, music has been such a impactful thing in my life, something I can find joy in, something I can find pain in. And you can share that experience with somebody and help them out by wearing something, share a memory with them. That's yeah. beautiful. Well, and that's... You're right on the fucking money. And that's why I don't mind in the slightest when I spend money on like you better like Simon Montero, like their stuff, or like the slums. Mm -hmm. You know, buying the I I'm literally buying the shirt from Leroy. Yeah, exactly. I know exactly <laughs> where that money's going. Yeah. You know, and then like like have you seen a show at Revel yet? Like the big venue at Revel? So no, but I do remember I think it was like Maybe one of the first times I met you was when the slums played at Revel, like when it was first opening. I'm not sure if you were there or not. No, we met at the Inside Out show. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, that's right. I remember yeah, that Inside night. Out. When it, was, it was pouring rain. Uh, yeah. uh, pouring <laughs> rain. I was fucked up. But yeah, yeah we, we were having that. a great time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I just remember being there. I was like, I remember hearing like, uh, what was the first big show? Uh, it was a rave. It was like Subtronics or something yeah. like that. And uh, I was really confused on how they were going to just have such a massive artist at such like that kind of venue. But I guess it works itself out in a sense. Well, so they've got more to the I – mean, I wasn't there, but I saw where the slums played. Mm -hmm. and that's like the piano bar. Yeah. But if you go all the way back, they built this giant like 3,000-person venue. Oh, okay. It's badass, dude. And that's where Ice Nine Kills was because if you go in – you, if you go in and you're facing through the doors, you've got the stage on your left, and you have a giant like there's. I'm sure that like like they had a uh, um, they had a bodybuilding show there a while back, sure. like a couple months ago. I'm sure they added seats for it, but it's a giant open floor plan. And then towards the back, it makes um, pretty much like a square, and bar, bar, bar. Mm -hmm. And then even next to the bar here, there's a merch space. So that's where all the band's merch is at. And then there's a balcony up top okay. with seats and t it's like a cocktail lounge almost. Oh, that's dope. Yeah. It's fucking now granted, I got and I've said this before and they have already said it on the pod, like great venue. The the bands put on a phenomenal show. But fuck that crowd. Oh, I bet. Dude, that is with I I've been in the pit. I've been in the pit for Avenged. Mm -hmm. I've been in the pit for Slipknot. I've been in the pit for fucking Green Day. A day, yeah, to, a day to remember. Sick. That would be awesome. Like, I, dude, one of the best fucking builds I've ever seen was a day to remember featuring on Avenged. Interesting. Oh. Oh, it was 2017, I think. Insane. Anyway, I've been in the pit for, like, not very heavy bands at all like Green Day and heavy bands like fucking Slipknot. Mm -hmm. And that fucking crowd for Ice Nine Kills was the worst. Because, yeah. cause, I mean, you've been in the pit, mm -hmm. obviously. The the general, like... I was in the pit for uh, for Smashing Pumpkins. Fuck yeah. Super chill. So yeah, <laughs> it's... So the general, like, etiquette, I guess, is between sets, if you want to move up... Do it. Try to make your way through, do it. Fair enough. If you want to make your way up between songs, do it. Fair enough. But while the song is playing... 
You and your fat ass friends are not trying to force your way through. And that was literally, I and I played for like 45 minutes an hour. Mm -hmm. And I would easily say 45 minutes of that fucking set was fat people and assholes (laughs) pushing behind me. And the girl that I was with, she's tiny. Mm -hmm. Like she's tiny. You've met her. She's tiny. So I'm literally trying to like put my arms like so she can move around. But like protect her from going down and then people don't know how to fucking crowd surf and how to like <laughs> like control their limbs so i'm like i'm like half trying to keep her up cuz we're just getting fucking mm-hmm. rocked and then i've got people flying this way and i'm catching heels and there's a few that i missed so i okay. caught like five heels to the back of my 100%. head she caught a steel cuz someone managed to like flip on their belly and she caught a steel-toed boot to her fucking oh. wrist. Yo, dude, we left the pit after the show was over. Yeah. And I, like, stood by a railing for, like, in the back. they have this, like, they have steel railing yeah, yeah. Uh, that are blocking off, like, the uh, the producer pit. Mm-hmm. So I, like, grabbed her. I was like, give me a second. Yeah. Because I thought I was fucking concussed. Yeah. Like, it. So now, like, for instance, on Friday, um, I'm going to go see Angel Maker. Uh-huh. Over at Launchpad. Okay. Blows my mind. Have you heard of Angel Maker? I don't, I don't know. That. So they're a deathcore band. Okay, weird. Fuck, they're actually, they're not the biggest, but they've got a decent following. Like, okay. And it's their headlining show, so I'm shocked they're at Launchpad. I'm shocked. Um, but Launchpad it's gonna be a, gets good-ass people sometimes. Mm-hmm. Launchpad gets crazy people sometimes. They do. They do. And I feel they'd be at Sunshine, though. Sure. You know? Um, but I'm going to mosey on in there. I'm going to get me a whiskey, and I'm going to the balcony, <laughs> and I'm minding my it. own fucking business. So we had uh, a very similar experience. I wasn't there personally, but um, my coworker who I went to Smashing Pumpkins with, he went the week before for uh, Post Malone to uh, Isleta. Oh, man. And they got pit tickets, and he just said that the crowd was the worst thing ever. Like, they were like, like even when it, like, it was a mosh, like, you know, people are throwing bows, like, people are getting in fights for that's no specific reason it, like a show that's supposed to be like relatively chill i can understand it like you know a deathcore band or something like that yeah where people want to get that aggressive but he was like we are absolutely not uh doing lawn or doing the uh pit just because people are just so inconsiderate about that stuff yeah and also like slightly on another topic something i deal with all the time is uh previously like, like working in a bar is at those kinds of events, you don't have too much regulation on how much alcohol people are consuming or what kind of substance people are using. And yeah. where, like, you know, in a setting where that is controlled, it's just be like, okay, no more for you. And you need to leave, stuff like that. And it's at least at a concert venue where it's like, unless you are nine out of 10. Dude, people just... people will get carried to the EMS where exactly. they're kicked out of the Slutta. Exactly. And like, I, I wanted to see Ghost when they came through, but I like, I part of me forgot about it. And I saw it the day I was like, "Fuck, I really want to go." But the other part of me was like, "Like, I love that band, but I'm not convinced I want to deal like deal with that crowd at a I'm slutter. Sure. I just I don't know if I want to do that anymore." That's personally why I don't like going to like rap shows. Is I've never been and I never will. I at, at least here one. in New Mexico, I've been to one, and no. uh, it was just a little concerning to see how many of those people were just so gone, like. You can't. You're not even listening to the music. It's just like an excuse to go get extremely fucked up in a public setting where you think you're anonymous. Where I don't know about you, but I like. I hate that. Like, uh, not like seeing other people. Like, you know, live your life, do yeah. whatever you want. But me personally, like, I don't like being very intoxicated in a public setting. No, and I. It's it's good you bring that up because there's been a few times. Uh, like the first concert I got really fucked up at was in 2017 when Hollywood and Dead came through. And it was the sunshine, mm-hmm. and I got fucked up. Yeah, I don't remember half that show. Exactly. And I, I was like, and I was like, shit. Like, I was with a good friend of mine. Like, I know I was taken care of, but I was like, you know. And then now, like, and and thank God, the guys in the slums are are such good fucking people because they have seen me. <laughs> They have seen me fucking sloshed. Oh, Nick has seen me at my my absolute <laughs> worst. <before. laughs> and up. and there's like to the point where I'm like I've slept in my car to oh, sober yeah, up. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? And We've like, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. But it's gotten to the point, or like I've crashed at like Leroy's place. Uh-huh. And um, I've had a couple of those nights in a row at their shows, and I was like, okay, I haven't embarrassed myself yet. 
I've gotten a little like over happy for sure. Yeah. But I haven't embarrassed myself. One hundred percent. And they're cool about it. But I'm not. I'm you don't not, want to be that guy. No, I'm yeah. not going to overstay my welcome with that, and I'm not going to be the guy who goes to their show and gets fucked up. And it's different if it's just like okay, like shows over, like like you know, both of us we we know that band well. Like, yeah. Like we will go hang out with them after the show, and right. like you know, once the show's over, we're like not as uh, public, and also like you know, at those shows, a lot of the people there like don't particularly know the band that well. Some yeah. do, some yeah. don't, but they don't want to see like oh like. The band themselves are really fucked up, which they never are. They never are super respectable and stuff like that. But like when you know, curtains are down, stuff like that. Like we live our lives, and like I I remember, uh, this is a funny story. I don't think you've ever heard this. I and uh, you know James, uh, we all like officially like really bonded for the first time. Is uh, we all met at Legion. and one night we're like, oh, let's go get some drinks. And we went to uh, Billy's Long Bar. Oh, which boy. I had never been before. Oh, boy. Yeah. That's gonna... a fun place. And uh, we were just like, oh, we're just going to have like a beer or two and leave. And uh, this man came up to us and it was like his 50th birthday, something like that. And he just like. This is off of San Mateo one. Yeah. That one, right? oh. um, and he fell in love with James. Like, <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> Uh, it was it was great. It was great. Um, so we're all sitting there, and this man is just kind of like hawking us, but like you know, we're we're not like particularly interested in this guy. Like, right? Like, he he was super drunk, stuff like that. And uh, this was also like first time we were really meeting Nicole for the first time. This was a couple years ago, and stuff like that. And uh, basically, this dude just proceeds to continue to send shots over to our table. Just so oh. I think our tabs each were like ten bucks. But we probably had like a good eight or nine drinks each. And it's like, it's a memory none of us will ever forget because it was just so funny. Like, I remember seeing, uh, like, when we left, Nick and Nicole like raced each other in the parking lot. <laughs> I love you, Nick, but you got absolutely smoked. Nicole kicked his ass. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and like, uh, James was our, like, our, our DD. Like, he didn't drink. But it was just so funny seeing, like, all of our interactions just, like, we were fucked up. But, yeah. like, we were just, like, all truly ourselves just fucking around. And that's how we all, like, we're just like, all right. Like, we love each other. Like, this is. Well, this and is that's cool. what's so cool. Like, obviously, like, alcohol, alcoholism, alcoholics exist and shit like that. But, mm-hmm. like, there is a reason why stuff, like, specifically, like, alcohol and peyote and marijuana there is a reason why all of those things have existed for th- tens of thousands of years. Sure. And why throughout that time they are community builders. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's like a, there's, I think each one has their own specific wavelength and psychedelics definitely do as well, but that's a whole other monster. Um, But like, does it with alcohol, there's like a, a wavelength Oh, you yeah. can get on with people. 100%. And if you manage to find yourself on that same wavelength as your friends yeah. or people you want to hang out with, you don't quite know that well yet, but you find yourself it's a on that yeah, on that frequency. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. So, I'm fucked up and you're fucked up and we still want to hang out. Okay, we're cool. So this is something I actually like really wanted to get into, bringing up alcohol, drugs, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Is, um, for m- people who don't know me, so I would assume most people, um, my background is uh, biochemistry and molecular biology. Okay, so before we get into all that, yeah, but I really want to. Okay, yeah, sit, yeah, yeah, 100%. because like, I brought up a couple of times on the pod, but there's a questionnaire I send out for first time guests, mm-hmm. and when I got yours back, I was like, "Oh shit, you've mentioned this before, but oh shit, that's right." Mm-hmm. Before we get into all that, you have some, you have stuff in a bag. Oh yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. So um, I'm very curious. I messaged Noah before I came, so like we were talking about before, like uh, I collect. Vintage clothes mostly, but there is another thing I collect where uh, also really random. I just saw some friends of mine at the thrift store buying them all the time. I didn't really see the point, and then I started buying a couple of them just to see like what the hype was about. Uh, so I collect old VHS tapes. Oh shit! And um, I have hundreds of them. Oh like, shit! Just in a box in my house, uh, and I hit you up just saying like, "Oh, what are your favorite TV shows, movies, stuff like that?" And so. I went through my little box before I left, and I brought a couple oh, old VHS tapes for you that you can just hang out. So, oh, fiction. Shit. That was the only one that I um, I have this old original SpongeBob one that ah. you said you love. <laughs> it's all the like original episodes. Uh, 
It. Oh shit! That's fucking cool. Uh, Jeepers Creepers. Oh, dude, I was yeah. this and this is sounds like in high school. This is the one that's been a part of my collection forever. It was one of the very first ones I ever found, but like, I never watched it. I think you should have it. This is one of the original animated Batman's. Oh, shit! So, th- dude, I remember renting this from like Hollywood Video. Oh shit! That is fucking dope. This is also really funny. So like. My, like, obsession with this started when I was, like, 10, like, and I just never knew it. Thank you. Of course. Before you go on, thank you very much. (laughs) Yeah. Holy shit. To me, like, I just feel like they're cool wall pieces, even if you're not going to watch them. They're just... Well, because they have, like, because I love, I love uh, collecting physical media Mm -hmm. in general. Yeah. Um, And it's very challenging, to say it lightly, to find VHS these days. Sure. It's challenging to find these. Um, so I collect like a lot of, um, like 4k and like Blu-rays and shit, like, like things that I know I'm going to want to watch sure. like continuously. i get a little bit, like there's a couple of vinyls scattered around mm-hmm. here. Um, but something that a lot of physical media doesn't have anymore is when you sit this on a shelf, how thick that is. Yeah. You can tell from a mile away what these are. Well, also like this one, for example, is just like, it's such classic artwork. Yeah, it's like, sick. and it's just. It looks good on a wall. Oh my god, that's fucking sick! Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, of course, man. That is fucking sick. <laughs> All right, what you were gonna say? Oh yeah. So, um, my like infatuation with these started when I was like ten. Um, so my mom, uh, she's been working in Hollywood for well, way before I was born. She's uh, she's been a uh, an editor forever. She uh, she was the head editor on the uh, the Real World. For like thirteen years. <laughs> oh yeah. shit! Have you seen the Chappelle? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where they all just keep fucking his girlfriend and then they kill his dad. Yeah, no, love that. Um, in fact, when that came out, uh, my mom had never seen Chappelle show. And oh, I sent that to her, shit. and she's like, "To be honest, like this is kind of what it is, like just in a extreme setting." So for people that don't know what we're talking about. Explain to them what the real world was. Um, so the real world was, in a sense, like one of the very original um, reality TV shows. It was just basically a bunch of crazy people, like like very attractive <laughs> yeah. crazy people who were all put in like some big city. So like New York, Miami, L.A., something like that. Yeah. And they all just lived with each other, like in this giant house. There was like, I don't know, like 16 of them living together, something like that. And they would all just live their crazy ass lives just being these attractive people. And basically like it was just like. You know, somebody would talk shit. There would be confrontation. Somebody would fuck somebody's girlfriend, something like that. Like, right. And just like total chaos, but just prime television. <laughs> <laughs> so, your mom was the editor. I, don't, I mean, maybe you know the answer to this question, but how much of the issues <laughs> on that show were instigated, like written in, like, hey, you need to cause some issues? Or how much of it was like them just being natural assholes? So I do know. Okay, the I just noticed this. this. This has a Hollywood video <laughs> sticker on that's it. That's awesome. Oh shit, that's so fucking cool. Um, anyway, yeah, so how much of that was instigated and planned and how much of it was like them just being them natural selves? I'd say about like now like how much do I know about this? Not too much. I'm sure yeah. my mom can answer that question much better than I could. But definitely like a decent amount of it is scripted. Almost all reality television you see now is just like it's not real. And then yeah. the other thing that like is a little scary about it but also like hilarious at the same time is like a lot of them are just like different moments from like an hour long interaction they just kind of like cut together to like make it seem way more intense than it actually is. That was like the first version of clickbait. Exactly, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, it was just shit. like, like you know, like the little like introduction, like uh, or like right before commercial, like coming up, like you fucked my girlfriend. <laughs> it's like, nah, fuck you. She's not your girlfriend. Like some shit like that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's really weird. Um, and I grew up a lot in that setting. And getting back to the VHS thing, uh, when she was living in Hollywood, uh, right before I was born, uh, South Park was coming out, and like, I don't think you know this about me, but like. One of my secret talents is like name a South Park episode 
and I can quote a line from it. It's Fuck, it's, yeah. it's bad, but <laughs> no, I've seen every single episode. Okay, so yeah, good good man. Good yes, man. <laughs> yes, I have seen literally every. I can't remember all of them. Obviously, I've seen. I've that's the only series that I've seen all the way through only once because it is. I look at because I want to rewatch all of it, and I'll like pick and choose like episodes. I'm the or same way, yeah. or I'll do like. I'll literally, like on HBO Max, I'll like scroll to a random season. Okay, scroll to a random episode and I'll choose it. But I look at all of it as like a behemoth. It is. Of like, I don't know if I can watch through all this again, but I will definitely watch a random episode. And the weird thing about South Park is there's like such a iceberg for it. Mm -hmm. It's like there's so much more to it than like yeah. what it seems on the surface. Yes. But uh, getting back to what we were talking about. Yeah. So she was working in Hollywood in 1997. Well, I I, is this when South Park is just coming out? No. This is oh, before it came out. Oh, before. So because South Park started in 93, right? No. 94? Uh, 98. 98. Right. Yes. You're right. Um, yeah. So Trey Parker and Matt Stone to basically send a pilot episode out. They sent a bunch of, I think it was like 500 to 1,000 copies of a VHS out to a bunch of big Hollywood people. And somehow, one of these VHSs ended up in my mom's hands. Um, and so it's the very original pilot episode of Santa Claus versus Jesus, if you've you ever seen that. You are kidding yeah, me. It's uh, wild. And I remember when I was like 10 or 11, I was at my cousin's house and we randomly watched an episode of South Park, which I was definitely not allowed to watch at the time. <laughs> Uh, and I was like, my mom, and I was like, oh, I love this show. I, I remember the first episode too. I watched it was, um, the one where Cartman eats all the, the fried chicken. They decide to ignore him and he thinks he's dead and a ghost. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Cause yeah. So they're, they, they're all at Stan's house and they have to bring in the groceries first and then they get the Colonel. Yeah. And then but Cartman eats all the skin. Eats off all the, the skin. And the, one of the best parts of that episode. Because it's, what's so good about shows that are written that well, it's like the quiet moments mm -hmm. that are the most funny. They're all there devastated. And then and Kenny it lasts, just starts crying. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It lasts for maybe a second and a half. But Kenny's like, <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Oh, so yes. I remember watching that episode. I'm like, This is gold. Like, I need to watch this. But obviously, I wasn't allowed to. And my mom's like, all right, I'm going to show you this one. You're still not allowed to watch it. And she dug out this VHS and showed it to me. And I was like, this is awesome. And it was the original fucking... And I never really thought much about it until I started collecting VHS. And I was like, I, I, rem I had that random memory one day. I'm like, I wonder what's up with that thing. And I called my mom and I was like, how did that land in your hands? And she told me the story behind it. I'm like... That is so cool. Uh, so I've been asking her for it for like a year now, and she won't give it to me, which is really well, that is like <laughs> the that's got to be up there in like the collector's items of South Park but, stuff. So I, also, like, there is one item that is so random in the South Park collector's items that is just like worth tens of thousands of dollars so i'm sure you've seen these probably when you're growing up they made they sold them at hot topic in like 2002 2003 um little south park plushies yeah like, so there's like a little cartman kenny and kyle whatever yeah and some dude at this factory decided i'm gonna make another one and so there's like five known to existence it's um do you remember the damien episode it's like yes. the son of satan. he's the son of satan yeah right they made a plushie of him that was like totally not supposed to happen some dude just decided to do it. Okay, I never get on my phone during episodes, but I'm going to go to eBay real yeah. quick. I don't know if they're up there, but um, there's like five known to exist, and they are so weird, but it's so cool that it happened. Like, just because these crazy South Park collectors have them. Right. But, yeah. Um, also, that show is just so genius. Uh, yeah, it's not even like... Because they made like they made little fig like, yeah so they made a mezco figure of him and mm -hmm. even that one's a hundred dollars, but that's like an actually like licensed like mint it was supposed to be made, yeah I can't even find it it's not it's not even coming up like the only thing is the the one thing that's coming up the most funny enough is the South Park uh, VHS that has his episode on it I, I have that one. <laughs> that's great uh and the other thing is like I refuse to buy these. Like I have to, uh, I have to find them if I'm gonna yeah. take it because I feel like you know it's like oh shit. 
Yeah, it's, it's, not, really it's, it's not even on eBay. Yeah, no I'll, exact... I'll find it for you after. It's really weird. Oh, my God. There's like a whole article on it. Um, it's strange. But, yeah. Um, Holy fuck. And then, yeah, uh, no. Uh, also, like, with the whole, like, music thing. Um, that's why my obsession with it kind of started with my mom. So, for example, um, oh, my God. What's that? Uh, what's that song? Um, oh, it's going to bug the shit out of me. Can't remember. Um so my mom in 2000, I don't know, like probably 2008, something like that, she was working on a 9-11 documentary. And, and we are filming. It's, it's so, so we're filming on 9-11. Uh, this drops on Thursday, but this is, we are filming on 9-11. So. And the whole intro for that show, um, also weird enough, the thing in editing that takes the longest by far is the intro. It has to be perfect. Yeah. Because it's you know, going to be in every single episode, basically. Um, there was a song for it by the Rolling Stones. Uh, I can't remember the name of the song, but I woke up every single morning for probably seven months at 6 a.m. to my mom because she, she like she wouldn't use headphones. She just blasted it in her room, uh, in her office, which was right next to my room growing up. Every morning I just wake up to the same fucking song. And I hate that song with my whole fucking being. But yet with that, just listening to her edit and stuff like that, just because, like, you know, 90s music was super popular at the time, or early 2000s music, also how I was introduced to Green Day and, like, Red Hot Chili Peppers, that kind of stuff. She would use those songs in, like, little, like, snippets over shit, and I would be like, ooh, like, what's that song? And that that's part of the reason how I became so fascinated with that kind of thing, so. Where were you living at this point? Uh, Santa Fe. So she was doing all her editing in Santa Fe. So also like a weird thing about her, um, she was working for MTV for a long time. She also did a lot of like big movies, uh, like '90s. Like I'm sure one of them you've seen is like uh, Young Guns. Yeah. Um, so she would come to New Mexico a lot for like projects and stuff like that. But like home base was in LA. And That's what I was imagining. Was like this has to be in Los Angeles. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so did you grow up in LA? No. Uh, for a couple of years, I lived there. Okay. Um, but my mom, uh, really decided cause she grew up in LA. Uh, she was like, I hate this city, uh, at least to grow up in. And so she decided I want to raise my child in Santa Fe. Which I couldn't is imagine she, growing up in LA. It would be weird, I think. And I, I partially grew up there for, I lived there for two years, uh, while she was still working out there. And, um, she was like, I don't want to work there. So she made a deal with MTV, uh, while she was working for them that she would fly to LA every two weeks deliver a hard drive with all the completed work, pick up a new one, fly back to Santa Fe, two weeks of work, go back and forth. She must have been a hell of a worker. That's crazy. That dude. woman is an angel. That is crazy, dude. Holy shit. It's also just weird, like, growing up, like, behind the scenes of all these shows and stuff like that. And yeah. Like, just the random people you would meet who were weird. What sticks out to you? People, let's say people you met. Let's start there. Um... Well, I know one we've previously talked about, uh, Dave Grohl. Yeah. Um, like, you know, if you ever watched any of his stuff, like, on the internet, it's exactly how he is. He's just, like, <laughs> funny, giggly dude. Like, uh, I remember, um, so he is very close with my cousin. And uh, we went to his daughter's wedding in San Francisco when I was probably, like, 14 or something like that. And the night after the wedding, they rented for the wedding, it was a... Uh, giant um sleepaway camp and they have a whole talent show venue so we so the whole family hosted a talent show what the fuck and um oh like some of these memories are just so strange but they'll always stay in my memory of like this one dude saying uh is it like wings beneath my feet or something like that whatever the name of that song is in fluent mandarin like <laughs> in a gospel voice. It was hilarious. <laughs> uh, these dudes who I was hanging out with all weekend, who I don't know who they are now, but um, I was like 14. Um, they did a lightsaber battle with brooms while they shaved one of their friend's heads with like strobe lights. <laughs> what the fuck? And then like a, a majority of my family are musicians, uh, big in the music industry and film industry. And um, Dave went on stage with, his daughter, as she sang a Taylor Swift song and he was on the drums. Wow. And it was just like so random, but so cool. At that's the same that's time. such a surreal moment. Yeah. Um, and then, like, 
Is the daughter anything? Like, did she yeah, go on to like actually, do stuff? Um, she is now, from what I've been told, I could be totally wrong on this, but from my memory, she is now one of the Foo Fighters' background singers. Wow. Yeah. Um. But she's huh. also like really random. Um, one of my favorite songs by them is uh. Um, but either way, like the whole music video is featuring his two daughters hmm. and, uh, it's really cool. Um, damn, it's going to bug me remember <laughs> that song. But, um, yeah, like, uh, he was one of the coolest dudes I've ever met. Willie Nelson was what you would expect Willie Nelson to be. You Just, met Willie Nelson. Yeah. That's cool. He, uh, he used to, uh, date my great aunt. <laughs> yeah. It's just, what? Super, it's just super random <laughs> stuff. Um, <laughs> But yeah, uh, he came to uh, he he had a show at the Santa Fe Opera in like 2015 or something. Okay, and we went onto his tour bus and he just opened the door and it's just like smoke just piling <laughs> out. <laughs> and then my mom's like, "Okay, you have to wait outside." And now she's told like like I guess they smoked with Willie Nelson or something like that. That's beautiful. Um, something like that. I don't know if she did or what happened, but the uh, the weed was involved. Um. <laughs> So yeah, that was cool. Um, there's a bunch of like random ones. The only other one that sticks out was, uh, and it wasn't like anything due to family. Um, I went to a Dodgers game and met uh, Rob Lowe, <laughs> <laughs> and he was he was a nice guy. But that's like, cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, the other thing though I really don't appreciate about um, like society nowadays, at least with those kind of icons, is like most of them are, at least from my experience, have never been dicks. And I'm sure some of them are, but like a lot of people have these or a lot of people portray these people as just like total assholes and the way they've interacted with celebrities. But I feel like majority of people don't know how to act with celebrities. Not saying that I do either, but like if somebody's having dinner or something like that, you don't go interrupt them. Right. Like, okay. Right. That seems strange to me. Like if you, I don't know. I, I agree. That's all I'm going to say is I agree. Like, interrupting someone's food in general, even if they're sitting by themselves, that's off-putting. If you really want to say hi that bad... Just wait. Wait till they leave? Yeah. And those people are used to that kind of thing where it's just like, okay, I'm out in public, like, minding my own business. Like, if I'm not doing something, come up to me. Say hello. Yeah. I'll give you an autograph. Whatever. Right. But if you're, like, you know, with your family or friends or something like that, like, you don't want to go up to those people and just be like... Hey, sorry to interrupt. But you direct all this. your attention to me. Yeah, just interrupt their good time. Like, yeah. It would be the same as like if you and your girlfriend are out at dinner and some random dude came up to you and was like, Hey, how's it going? What's your name, man? Just like, dude, like, we're busy. Like, it's, fuck off. It's strange. At a minimum, it's strange. No matter how nice you're being about it, it's just fucking strange. Yeah. Um, I met John Bernthal okay. uh, at the gym here in Albuquerque. Yeah. Uh, this is literally a week after he got announced as the Punisher. Huh. Uh, he, I forget, I think he was filming Sicario down here. Okay. Um, it was late at night because I used to work at uh, Pelicans on the east side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got off a late, a late fucking shift. I was closing, and I went out at the time. I had a free membership to my to my mom at uh, Sports and Wellness. Right. So I went to the one that's off of uh, off of Wyoming, like Paseo yeah, yeah. towards there. So I'm I'm there. And I obviously I've seen the fucking Walking Dead. I'm a big fucking comic book nerd, so I know that Bernthal is gonna be the Punisher. And uh, I remember working out there, and I see this dude doing tricep extensions. <laughs> and I'm like, "There's no fucking way." And I was I was maybe eighteen, mm -hmm. I think eighteen. Yeah, I was eighteen. It was 2015. And I, I walked over and I was like, "Hey, like." Are you John Bernthal? And the <laughs> nicest guy in the world. Is like, yeah. And it's fun. I feel like all those guys who play these like super serious, scary characters are the are. kindest dudes. They typically are. And dude, he took a picture with me and he like took time out of his night to like, because it was, fu it was funny because later I would find out because there's this comic book store that I go on the east side. Um, I've been going since I was like seven years old. Mm -hmm. And 
I walked in and I was like, you guys are not going to believe who I met last night. And one of the owners, Eric, he goes, John Bernthal. Motherfucker. What do you mean? He goes, look behind me. And he had literally come in the last week on my birthday. He came in. He came in and he apparently he walked in and was like, I want all your Punisher books. Give me, Give me your best Punisher stuff. And he spent like 250. And those are the type of like actors who, and same thing with like musicians who are like, I feel like they're dedicated to their craft. Yeah. Is like, um, yeah. what's his name? Like, this is really random. I'm like a little bit of an anime nerd. Um, Fair enough. Yeah. So, uh, the One Piece uh, live action just came out. I've heard it's great. It was pretty good. Like, I've heard as somebody it's who's great. watched the anime, like, there are parts I really did not like about it and parts that were, I really did. Um, and I will say, though, that like the actors, just from what I saw from like behind the scenes stuff, like, you know, watch the whole show, read the manga, stuff like that. And it's like, I can respect the dedication to the craft where it's rather like, okay, like I'm doing this show. Who gives a shit? Yeah. Like it's money. Like those kind of people, I'm like, they want to make the viewer's experience better than what it possibly could be. Well, cause I, especially with stuff like, cause I'm kind of into, I, I'm very simple sure. when it comes to anime. I like Berserk. I right. like Attack on Titan. Yeah. I like Naruto. <laughs> you know, the real simple shit. Like, yeah, uh, sure. all of the... The guy who wrote um, uh, Uzumaki, uh, like, the ho- horror-based anime. I forget, okay, yeah. I forget, I forget, uh, Junji Ito. I've never seen it, but I've heard. I So, I've only read it. Okay. Um, but they did turn it into an anime. They're turning it into an animation, but I know it's a movie. Apparently, the movie sucks. But <laughs> Most like, of them do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Junji Ito stuff, I like. And then Death Note. That's one of my all-time favorites. Yeah, those are the ones that come to mind. Um, but being a fan of stuff like that, especially like comic books, I would make those are so popular now. Mm-hmm. As a fan, you want you only get more invested if you find out the people portraying your favorite characters are just as invested, or at least took the time to learn 100%. as much as you have. Yeah, you know what I mean. And and I would think now with especially with, as with as much money is behind all these projects, if you're getting paid millions mm-hmm. to do anything you should probably invest all your time in it and especially like if they if i got approached with a fucking contract and they're like hey you're gonna play x character all you have to do is get in shape eat right and read comics i would i'd ask 100%. okay whose dick am i sucking right now like who's i'm getting a free trainer dietitian and steroids who give me it all yeah, like, I'll do it for free. I feel like the most extreme uh, example of that, uh, maybe not in that sense, is like Heath Ledger. Yeah, well, and that and that goes into like the method acting kind of stuff, where it's like, okay, it, it, well, the unfortunate thing about him is he already had uh, allegedly like he already existing mental illness. Yeah, he had pre-existing mental illness, and he already had a pre-existing addiction to, to sleeping medications. Sure. Um, so like not a good combo. Yeah, yeah. So that was already an issue, but. I mean, how much of that? Because when it comes to, because I, I, we're talking about like the responsibility of how much they care, right? A lot of that is on the casting manager and the casting sure. directors for sure, and of course, it lies on the person that gets picked, mm-hmm. right? Especially now, when it's like, hey, and even back then in two thousand eight, well, let's say two thousand back in of two thousand six, when two thousand seven, when they were casting Heath Ledger, um, comic book films have already been established by then. Like you're already knuckle deep into the Spider Man trilogy, X Men, Blades already come out. Yeah, and you have the plethora of, of like animated stuff, so they knew what they were getting into. But then, when you have the the added like negative element of something like Heath Ledger was going through, sure, that is unfortunately on him. And then I again, I doubt that any executive told them, "Hey, you're gonna lock yourself in a fucking hotel room for what was it, eight to ten weeks." And write into a journal and become the Joker. And obviously, obviously, he put in a stellar performance. Uh-huh. Absolutely stellar. But at the same time, I mean, there, to say to say the Joker role killed him, I think, is really undermining what he was already dealing with. Agreed. Like, I don't like that narrative. But yeah, I would also say that, like, it's like the method acting thing. It's just yeah. like when somebody is put in that role, especially with like that pre-existing condition or stuff yeah. like that or addiction, um, 
it definitely doesn't help and can bring out a lot worse. And like, yeah. especially with like memory things, um, you see a lot of people that end up like living with uh, trauma and stuff like that, uh, especially when they were a child and it comes back to like haunt them. And especially when you live in a, like us live a life full of, I don't want to say the word like evil, but like things that are traumatic in a sense that you're supposed to like live that life. It could definitely take a toll on even somebody that doesn't have mental, like mental health. Well, you got to think like, so let's completely remove, I don't even know if it's, if it's conspiracy anymore. So I was listening to a Joe Rogan episode recently. It just came out with Tulsi Gabbard and BJ Penn. Mm-hmm. A lot of it was focused on the Hawaii stuff that's going on right now sure. with the fires and um, the just government incompetence. Mm-hmm. Um, but they it brought up a good point. Um, and BJ Penn said this, and he said, nowadays conspiracy theories are just spoiler alerts for the future. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so completely removing the conspiracy theories of the evil in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. You got to imagine like what these guys, especially well, and women as actors and actresses are going through. They are living a life where 99% is rejection. Oh yeah. Like, okay. So you look at, I, I recently, so I, I had to get surgery at the end of May for my, I think I mentioned yeah, it to you for yeah, my, for my hernia. And so when I was down for the count for like a week, um, I got into euphoria. Sure. I was like, fuck it. I'm already I, I'm already down. Like I'm on the fucking couch. Um I might as well just fucking I've heard so many great things about it. I'm gonna try to get into it. And I loved season two. Season one was good, but I love season two. And but I I understood why people like it, right? But I look at that show and I'm like, okay, for every Zendaya, mm. for every Sydney Sweeney. For every the the guy that plays like the big tall jock, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? For every one of those actors and actresses, how many people got rejected out of that oh, role? Hundreds. You know what I mean? And then and then I look at stuff like they just casted um, uh, David Cornsweat mm-hmm. as the new Superman. How many dudes got rejected from being the new Superman? Who how many people are going to get rejected from being the new Batman and the new Wonder Woman? Da, 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 right. So these actors and actresses are living a life of rejection. And they're continuing to just go through this tumultuous, just saying, you're not good enough. We're not going to talk to you. We're not going to do All these type of things. And then all these people, you know, they feel like, and for, for proper reason, they need to go out and network. I sure. need to meet people. Well, how do you meet? I've I don't I've never lived in L.A. Uh-huh. I've never been a part of that life. But just from the absolute like microscopic version of networking and meeting people to do this podcast, you know, I meet people. And like Instagram is a big helper. Sure, Instagram is a huge helper. But the the number one way that I have met people and and like, but like, hey, you might be. I, I think either I think that to myself or I tell them in person. The number one place that I've, at least in the last eight months, that I've met people to come on this podcast has been out at bars. Oh, 100%. That's uh, just how it fucking is. So so uh, what are these people living, right? They're going to want to network, and they get all fucked up. They get, hey, man, yeah, let's have a couple of drinks. Oh, yeah, remember, hey, uh, I don't know if you're about it, but we've we got a couple lines in the back. Maybe yeah, we could talk yeah. a little more. This will help you keep going with your butt. And it, 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 it just <laughs> turns into this thing. So I have a, I have a good story about this. Um, and part of the reason why I hate LA so much is um, I'd lived there for a couple of years. I was young, didn't really understand this. And then um, right out of high school, uh, me and some friends went to go visit another homie who was uh, had just been signed at a huge modeling agency and was contracted out in LA for two months. And so we went to go see him. And um, he says to us, uh, like, hey, do you guys want to go out tonight? And we're like, um, sure, why not? And so we go out to this like weird like 18 plus club, but it was like very uh, particular on who comes in. And so when we went, uh, they assumed just because we were with our friend and his other friend, uh, who was also part of the modeling agency, that we were all models for this company. And I remember going in this place and meeting just so many people, like just networking, even though I wasn't trying to network, they were networking with me. 
and like at first it was like you know little chit chat like let me get to know you this kind of stuff and then it would be like so what do you do and as soon as i'd be like oh like i'm a college student something like that and they're like well what are you doing here and i'm like oh like we're visiting our friends like who's the model and they'd be like okay cool and just walk away like to me like a lot of the uh the people who live that kind of lifestyle, not particularly just acting, but like anything that is portraying um, a physical person, not like intellect in a sense, is uh, people want something out of you, which is very common in this world. But L.A. specifically, at least in that scene that I experienced, was a lot of these people are just there to use you for their own well-being. Uh, that like, oh, you're a model. Let me uh, like I have this friend. Like, he'll do a shoot with you. Let's go do that. I'll make some money off you. Something like that. And to me, like, that's super disturbing as a person who's just like, I don't really give a shit what you do for a living. You could be a fucking janitor or you could be a CEO of a company. As long as you're a good person and, like, I share something with you that that I think could benefit both of us, I have no problem in hanging out with you. I just personally, as, like, my own person, I find that very demoralizing almost it is but i would also say time and place sure right because if it's that type of club meant for that type of people that's why everyone's there i'm not justifying it i'm not taking away from like the lack of humanity that's there but you got to imagine these people these people that are there they're just like hey time is money Sure. It's 12 o'clock in the morning or 12.30. Everyone's going to be gone by three. So I've got three hours to mm-hmm. work with and time moves fast when everyone's a little buzzed. Ten spans are short. So they're trying to figure out who can I talk to? What connection can I make? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it, and and what I will say too, especially growing up and spending a lot, because I'm imagining you're spending a lot of your time in New Mexico, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, Living in a place like New Mexico where everything is so like tiny and tight knit and close, like the not even if it wasn't for the smaller population, just the Hispanic mindset where if you're not real with people, if you're not authentic with people, even if you're not there to learn somebody's life story, if you're not acting genuinely nice to somebody and you just been like, the, ah, How's it going? <laughs> like that type of shit where people, well, people will literally tell you to go fuck yourself. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. Spending so much time here and then going to L.A. or reflecting on an experience like that, no shit you feel that way. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But I would I would kind of say as well, like, that, it sounds like to me from that little experience, that place you went to, it's a business. It, it's a conference room with lights and liquor. 100%. And you like, know what I mean? I, like, I can respect that hustle for sure, but at the same time, like... No, but you also have your morals. Yeah, yeah. And and LA is devoid of that. A hundred percent. It is it is devoid of that. And that's not only my small experiences there, but that's me knowing people there. And that's yeah, you know, literally me having friends that, like so one of my very good friends, uh, he this is back in fuck, like twenty eighteen, I I'm think. Take some more oh, right go there. ahead. Go ahead. There is more than enough. Do you want some? Uh, oh yes, sir. All right, cool. Thank you very much. Um, so he lived in LA for a while. And the poor guy, like, I love him to death, and he is in the army now, but um, he was living in L.A., and he's a very talented videographer, mm-hmm. like, legitimately talented at videogra- videography and editing. Sure. Very talented in that. And I remember going out there because uh, w- uh, he had graduated high school with me, and one of our friends used to have this tradition where we would go down... To one of our friends' family's cabin, Rio Doso, sure. during the holidays, party, get all fucked up, reunite, whatever, move up, move out of business, right? Um, and the last one that I went to this is back in 2018. Uh, he needed, a, he was gonna hop a Greyhound to L.A. Sure. And I was like, I'm driving to San Diego. I'm literally driving to San Diego after this. I'll just take you to L.A. Huh? Like, what? I'm not gonna make you pay for a bus. Yeah, what the fuck? And I get to nap on half my drive. Yeah. Like this is great. So we hopped my. I miss my Mustang so much. <laughs> I miss. I totaled it because I fucking hydroplane into a damn curb. I miss that bitch so much. Damn. Yeah. Anyway, so we hop into my Mustang, hightail it to L.A., and I went and spent a night with him up there, and just 
he he was living at the time in this pretty nice apartment uh, that overlooked a lot of like not the sky. The LA doesn't really have a skyline, but like like the the downtown ish yeah. of LA. And I remember talking to him and all of his roommates and just hearing all the shit they got into and like this the shit how they got like they were getting caught up with some bad people at one point and how they got like swatted at one point, Jeez. but for actual Coke, like they thought they were like harboring drugs and shit like that. And hearing just all the nonsense that they had gotten into just to meet people, just to shoot for people, just to go up that ladder. Right. And then, so that was December of 2018. Yeah. 2018 March of not even fuck like middle. No, it was right around Valentine's day of, of, uh, February 2019, he gives me a call and he goes, Hey dude, um, you know, a lot of what I've gotten into, but, uh, I've gotten into some bad shit. I need to get the fuck out of here. Like, what are my options? Like, how, what's the army like? What's the army life like? Stuff like that. You have a lot of friends that are in the military. We have friends in the military. Like, I was like, dude, this is what you do. You should probably go active duty. You get the fuck out of there. All that stuff. And now funny enough, he's a combat videographer. Huh? In the army. That's awesome. Yeah, exactly. And so, like, between stuff like that, hearing their stories, and then hearing stuff like yours and all these things, again, removing the conspiracy theories of the actual evil in L.A. and Hollywood in general, if you're not going into that with the mindset of, I am going to get my dick kicked in. Oh, 100%. For the hope that I make it kind of big. Mm-hmm. You don't belong there. And even now with the like, so if, if people, I, and I've told my friends this, like look into why the writers and the actors are striking right now. It's not because Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt and Tom Holland and fucking Scar Joe and all these people can't act. That's not why they're striking. They're striking because fuck, like 85% of the writer's guild has two to three jobs outside of writing for Hollywood, and then 93% of the Actors Guild has two to three jobs outside of acting? Like, that's why. Yeah. It's like you see all these, like, fuck, uh, Riverdale. Mm-hmm. There's I forget the guy's name, but I remember he had gone on to Reddit, and he was talking about his experience as an actor, and he was talking about his experience in the union and what the what the writers union or the what, what the writers union and the actors union was really doing with the strike was like poised towards and he was talking about how like in Riverdale because he was not billed as a main actor or, or no for for TV it's recurring he wasn't recurring even though he had been in like 8 or 10 episodes of a like a 15 to 20 episode season sure. like consistently but he was a supporting instead of recurring the the pay difference was six figures and so he's like that's why we're fucking striking because sure. i'm putting in not as much but a shit ton of work for getting only like the fraction a fraction of what they're fucking getting and so yeah, just the environment of and, and personally, like I still want to get in. Like I was going to film school, uh, for a minute, but for reasons we'll talk about off the podcast. The how I say this the the program that I was getting funding through decided to cut the budget for education. Oh, okay, uh, decided to cut their education, and that's why I'm quitting this pro or getting out of this program in November. Sure, uh. I had to drop out of film school in UNM. Okay. And so I still want to get into like the film industry and do all these type of things, but that's why my goal is to move to Austin and not LA. Austin is. Because LA is actively dying and Austin and, Ten- Austin and Nashville is ex- are exploding right now. And the reason I'm going to Austin instead of fucking Nashville is Austin's got stand up and podcasting and I'm just not the... Oh, I'm not Nashville. 100%. You know what I mean? So it's just, it's wild to see. And you know what? Without getting extremely political, but the politicians aren't exactly helping in California right now. They're I don't not. Think they are anywhere. They aren't. You know what I mean? And especially what, what New Mexico is going through right now. Like we're making national news. No, for people, because 
I'm very thankful for this. I'm not talking shit. But there is an audience for this podcast outside of New Mexico. So anybody outside of New Mexico right now, you're good. It's just a like. <laughs> but for people outside of New Mexico listening right now, New Mexico does not make national news. Very rarely. We, it, it takes it, it it takes extreme, extreme incidents measures, yeah. for us to make national news. And right now, this is it. With this fucking gun ban for 30 days of no concealed and no open carry. I mean, who, who's that going to stop, though? Like, like it, Well, that's the crazy thing. Is So did you see the press conference with Grisham? No. So there are two major points out of it that people are flipping out about for, for good reason, right? The first one is what you just said. Is a journalist, an actual fucking journalist, asked her, hey, so... Who is this going to stop? Because historically, criminals don't follow gun laws. Who is this going to stop? And you know what her answer was? Well, with her fucking Karen cut. <laughs> well, so I know this isn't going to stop criminals, but it's going to send a message. It's sending a message of total bullshit. Exactly. <laughs> and it's sending a message of I'm going to punish right, uh, law-abiding gun owners, first of all. And second of all, the big thing that was asked of her was, was, um, hey, this other journalist, that was a female that asked, and a male journalist asked her, hey, so with this new ban, because he was dumbfounded, mm-hmm. obviously, he was like, hey, with this new gun ban, um, that means a card carrying concealed, a concealed weapon, hold, like holder, it, what if they're, they're carrying their fucking handgun? down the street and they get stopped and frisked by a police officer, they could get arrested. Yeah. Her response to that was, well, maybe they should. Oh, I'm willing to do ridiculous. anything to stop gun violence in New Mexico. And it's like, bro. I mean, or, I also saw something around, like something saying the, the APD, you're not going to. Uh, nope. So the APD chief, I'm going to say this, I got to take a piss real quick. Sure. The APD chief, he was smart about it. And he read the actual ordinance and the actual like document, I guess, that came out of the governor's office. And what that document said was that it's at a state level to enforce it. Mm-hmm. So he was smart, and he was like, "Hey, we're only gonna have, uh, we're only gonna worry about this if the state police get involved. APD is only concerned with arresting uh, felons and criminals of the law." Otherwise, we're not going to enforce this. That is on the state police officers. Sure. And then today, the head sheriff of Burnco came out and was like, I was elected as sheriff to support and defend the Constitution. And this is unconstitutional. Understood. We're not going to do it. And he was, dude, this is some of the most, because look, like just like in the military, you start hitting general, you're a politician. Law enforcement, you start hitting police chief, you hit sheriff, you're a politician. politician yeah. So, but this was some of the most real I've ever seen a politician be because he was like, Look, we have enough issues. We have enough violence. My officers are already getting in enough issues to the point where their lives are on the line. This is just going to create more. I'm not going to create more problems by having them because they know, because they're frankly, they're all either libertarians leaning right or just straight Republicans. And they know that this law or this law, this executive order, it only affects these people that quite frankly, they just want to be left alone. 100%. Dude, don't fuck with me. Don't fuck with me. Don't fuck with my gun laws. Don't fuck with my individual rights. Just leave me alone. So he was like, hey, we're not going to enforce this. If we're going to get in trouble for this, it'll fall on me. But we are not going to create more problems for my officers than we already have. Because why the fuck would they? So for me, like, as somebody, like, I'm, I'm very open about this. But, like, personally, I am not a big gun supporter uh, for my own reasons. Um, yet, I think that this gun ban is creating so many problems. Like, to me, like, uh, something I've said <laughs> many times in the past is um, for a while, like, um, the democratic system was trying to like eradicate eradicate gun gun use from the general public, which for one is like extremely unconstitutional. But like you're basically asking if you were to take away people's guns, like you're asking for almost a civil war. Like that one, like don't get me wrong, it's like it's totally wrong to like 
harm somebody with a gun in majority of situations. Um, but yet, like, it is that your right to carry one and in the correct situation to use one. Um, so, like, to take that take that constitutional right away from people is just going to create havoc and create problems for police officers, create problems for the general public. And, like, for example, I know, um, I want to say it was, like, an old town or something. There was some sort of protest that was supposed to happen. And there was... Well, it happened today. Oh, did well, it? Well, it happened today and on Sunday. There were people out near, like, right on the Capitol lawn and shit like that protesting. 100%. And, like, to me, it's just, like, I understand, like, especially in New Mexico, there's a very large amount of violence. And a lot of that has to do with guns. But, like, you also look at the statistics of, like, uh, sure, like, like gun violence is in the United States is way higher than any other country. But then you look at places like the UK where it's just, like, compared to the US, like, uh, crimes involved with, like, knives are just extremely higher than here. And it's because, you know, you can't carry a gun there. It's much harder to acquire. It's just mirrors. Exactly. So it's just, like, if you were to take that away, like, the violence is still going to happen. And, like, the same thing in the UK. If you were to ban knives, like, people would revolt. Uh, you would create more and more issues. So, in my opinion, it's just it's incredibly ridiculous. In a sense, like, again, for personal reasons, like, I... I'm going to take that back. I don't support it. But I just think by our governor is just stupid. It's asinine. Exactly. Let's take a break. Sure. I got to pee. And we'll be right back. And we're back. <laughs> um, I saw you throwing in a couple uh, – you're a zinner. I am. I am. Dude, I swear, man, like I think caffeine and nicotine are fucking miracle drugs. They are. I really do. I throw in a zin. I have 15 minutes to get somewhere safe for a <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, I don't know what's up. Because so, like, I tried a zin for the first time when I was working. Like, it was back in 2020, mm -hmm. uh, August-ish. And I was like, I, I I enjoy dipping. I'm about to throw one of these in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I enjoy dipping. But I was like, man, like I'm told these zins, you can gut them. And I can't exactly spit inside of a warehouse. Because I, I was at a carpeting company. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I'm spending all my day loading carpet, pulling materials, cutting carpet, doing deliveries. I can't really spit that much. So I'm going to try these zins. I threw one three milligram in, dude. They're rough. Bro, I fucking hurled. Like yeah. I, I remember, I threw it in, went on a went on a delivery, went on a pickup, came back to the warehouse. I was gone maybe twenty minutes. Mm -hmm. Dude, this is how I know there's a God. God <laughs> allowed me to park the truck, lock it up, and make it to the bathroom before I hurled everywhere. So... And I told my boss, I was like, "Hey, I gotta go. I just puked. I'll see you tomorrow." And <laughs> I was sick the whole. And even like. Fucking three months ago, two months ago, when I was... Have you met Joey? One Joey, of the roommates? Yeah, Joey Salazar, have you met him? I think I met him once, but I, I honestly don't remember. Just in passing, yeah. So he he's, he throws in a zen a lot, mm -hmm. right? And so I had to take him because he came back from a trip and he left his truck at his parents' place. So I went to go drop him off and we were hanging out at his parents' place and I threw a zen in it. And again, another 3% and I, or a three... Uh, milligram. A milligram. And I was spitting it still, dude. I had 15 fucking minutes so into that. I'm and the I was exact just, same way. And I was dip. just... Like, I, and it's uh, one, a tolerance. Um, so, like, the thing with Zins that is, like, different from that is that you are basically just swallowing uh, nicotine salt. Yeah, straight fucking nicotine. Yeah. Right. Um, and I remember... So, like, the whole reason why I do them now, um, like, one, like, you know, trying to kick the addiction just because, like, it's not... Like, nicotine, for one, is not harmless to you. Were you a smoker? No, I like vape. Um, okay. But, uh, like nicotine itself is not super harmless to you. It's more like the way that, uh, it is like brought into your body. It's like vape, cigarettes, dip, stuff like that. It's just all a bunch of, uh, carcinogens. Um, so, and just like through research and stuff like that, like it's just kind of obvious that like having something you rather spit or swallow is much healthier for you than something to, uh, to inhale. Uh, now, to be fair with Zins compared to Dip, um, there is not as much research on it just because it's only been out in a couple of years. Um, but I was the same way when I first started. I like, I was like, okay, these are a good alternative to get away from uh, vaping and stuff like that. And I remember my first week, I was in, I was in a uh, toilet hell. <laughs> so were you vaping first and then throwing in a Zin? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or well, like, so unfortunately. Um, 
I was like introduced to like the jewel in like high school. Mm. And like, unfortunately, especially for kids nowadays, and it's still happening is like, uh, teenagers are getting addicted to nicotine, which for one, like they shouldn't. Um, and that addiction has just lasted and it sucks. But, uh, in my opinion, like also for these, for me, like for work is great. Cause I don't have to like, you know, go smoke somewhere or something like that. Um, uh, I can just throw one of these in. and Because it sounds like, to me, this is like the new age uh, nicotine patch. Yeah. Uh, mm, no. Because um, nicotine patches are, like, basically trying to lean you off. These are more like, this is a... Maintaining, a, almost. A maintaining. Yeah. Uh, honestly, like, probably the nicotine intake is even higher. But rather, like, you... Because a lot of the studies... So, like... Uh, I remember the first reason why I quit vaping was um, people using uh, box mods. Um, is that they looked at people like uh, like deceased people who had uh, been using like box mods for vaping to quit smoking, and they'd been using those for years. And unlike a cigarette lung, which is black and has holes in it almost and stuff like that, and almost riddled with like cancer, um, the lungs themselves weighed like three pounds more than what they should. And because of that is that when you get some sort of liquid in your lungs, it's really hard to get it out of it. So like, like people who get like water in their lungs, like that's a major issue. Um, so with vaping, like especially with a box mod where you're going through so much juice, it's just going straight into your lungs. So people were carrying almost pounds of vape juice in their lungs when they were dying. Oh shit! So that how was, much is this is getting reported? Not much. I've never heard of this. Mm-hmm. Um, so like it, it was. I remember reading that article and like in school, like it, like I did like a very very brief study on it, and it was just like, wow, this is really bad for you. Um, and plus, like you're inhaling chemicals, most of which, like especially with the disposables, like not all of them are FDA approved. Like, are any? Um. I th- don't quote me on this, but I think like Jewel now is. Um, There's no way. Like something like that. I'll, again, I'll look it up because we're gonna have a producer tonight. But I'll look it up because I remember, I remember when Jewel was coming out, they tried to ban it in the states, mm-hmm. but I feel like they banned it over in the UK. So they did, but majority of the reason for that, from my memory, was that it seemed like just because it was the very first vape or something like that, was that it was uh no, it's not. Yeah, so the FDA banned Jules products because Jewel has officially answered the agency's questions on the toxicology data uh, the company had submitted in an application for its original vaporizer to maintain on the market. Uh, the FDA put a ban on the hold while the company appealed. Uh, now I'm going to see if... if any of them are. Uh, is Jewel banned anywhere? Because I could have sworn. So uh, it's partial. Like part of it is banned in the U.S. Uh, okay, so it wasn't until June twenty third of twenty twenty two the FDA banned Jewel from selling and distributing its products in the United States. In addition, really? uh, those currently on the U.S. market must be removed or risk enforcement action what yeah so you can go buy jewels at the gas can, station but it's the same thing as cigarettes in a sense is like they have that little message on the back like be aware of like carcinogenic uh, properties in this like this could give you cancer don't do this if you're pregnant stuff like that um the one i do remember when i was in college was when they did a total recall on like almost all of the flavors for it so like uh like mango flavored mint flavor that kind of stuff because um it wasn't Trump. Uh, was it Trump? Oh, okay. So here we go. Here's the answer. So uh, the FDA banned Jewel products from being sold in the U.S. by issuing a market denial order on June 23rd, 2022. But the agency has since put an administrative hold on the ban until it can review Jewel's market application again. Uh, this is a direct quote from the FDA. Sure. Uh, July 5th, 2022, FDA administered administratively state the market denial order. The agency has determined that there are scientific issues unique to the Juul application that warrant additional review. This administrative stay temporarily suspends the market denial order during the additional review, but does not rescind it. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like Juul threw some money towards a lobbyer. It does. does. 
for the FDA and was like, hey, how about we just delay this for a mm-hmm. few years and eventually you're going to back off and let us do our fucking thing. Well, what I remember is that um, a lot of like the flavors of it got recalled because um, people were saying that they were um, more advertised to underage kids. Like, oh, like because at first this was like the big thing before, like disposables where you can get like peach melon ice or something right. like that. Like before, that was like the first thing where I was like, you can smoke mango flavored vape, basically. It was all happy and bubble gummy. Exactly. And, and right. it was, they were saying it was advertised towards an underage audience. Um, and so they recalled all that. And I remember like the only two flavors you could get after that were either tobacco flavor or menthol flavor because the whole point of Juul was to lean people off smoking. So, yeah. Because <laughs> oh, like I remember in high school, I kind of smoked cigarettes. I didn't get into chewing until I was like 22. I feel like that kind of comes with the military um, in a sense. Yeah, so I, 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 I smoked a little bit in high school, just like socially, mm-hmm. wasn't really a thing. And I tried Juul like when it was getting big ish, and I fucking hated it. Like it looked, it felt like I was inhaling knives. Well, I feel like that's a lot of people who like are going from like cigarettes to vapes. It is like it's not the same. It's, like, the same with me. It's, like, if I were to smoke a cigarette, like, personally to me, it's not as enjoyable. Just because, like, one, like, the nicotine output is different just because it's coming straight from tobacco and, like, other chemicals where, like, this, like, you're basically just doing nicotine salt and a bunch of chemicals that you have no idea what they actually are. Right. See, and that's why I prefer, I prefer, the to- obviously, I prefer the tobacco. It's the natural stuff. <laughs> 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 so, w- your background in neurology Mm -hmm. is interesting to me yeah so what is your background in it so um in college i uh i was originally a finance major uh my freshman year and i realized um i hated that uh my freshman year i really got into like philosophy stuff like that and it made me realize like okay this is definitely not what i want to do and so i looked into some stuff like uh kind of applying like my own moral application to things and realized, like, okay, what I want to do is help people. And I got into, uh, like, a pre-med field. And at first, it was, like, kind of a, a balance between, like, do I want to do biology? Do I want to do chemistry? And I looked into professions of that. And it was, uh, you basically have, like, three options with those degrees. Like, you can be a chemist, you can be a biologist, or you can work, in, or you can get higher education into medicine. And I chose uh, biochemistry, which if you decide not to do that, you have a lot more options too. You can do research in certain fields. Uh, even in some sense, you can be like an engineer, stuff like that, just because you are working with more than like the basics in a sense. So my major in college was uh, biochemistry and molecular biology. And like I briefly mentioned, uh, philosophy was a big thing to me. Um, and one philosopher, uh, his name's Sam Harris. Um, you might've seen him, he's on Joe Rogan all the time. Um, I listened to one of his lectures and it really inspired me because he is also a neurologist or of sorts as well as a philosopher and the way he uses, uh, literal research as well as cognitive thinking. Um, you can not only like deliberate the problems in your own life and other people's lives, but also help people at the same time. Well, he's like the definition of. Not only a modern day philosopher, a philosopher, but a, a realist, and also a huge atheist. Yes, uh, which which his the atheism and the realism feed into each other extremely well. In the yes. way he process, I haven't listened to a, and I've admittedly, I haven't listened to a lecture or a podcast of his in probably about a year and a half or so. Sure, because like he hasn't popped up my algorithm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've yeah, I've seen him on Rogan a few times. I've seen him on uh, Lex Friedman. Yep. You know, um, and I think the reason for that is that now he has his own podcast, which is kind of blowing up. Oh shit! Yeah, that, that makes sense. But I, just, I didn't think to. I'll have to check that out because yeah. he's a really again. I don't agree, on a religious side. I don't agree with him. I don't but, either. But but he, I agree with his concepts. Yeah, he he articulates himself and presents himself extremely well. Yeah. Um. So in the biochemistry standpoint, I um decided basically in the last like year and a half, I was like uh well, what do I want to do? Because personally, I would love to go to medicine. Plan is within the next year is get into med school and start that journey. 
Um, and I was kind of thinking, well, like, what do I want to do? Like, do I want to make a lot of money? Do I want to, like, how do I want to help people in a sense? And uh, throughout my life, I've dealt with a lot of people with Alzheimer's and dementia uh, in family and outside. And that is what I realized. I was like, this is what I want to do. Um, I want to do research and clinical studies in helping Alzheimer's and dementia patients and basically figuring out why the brain does this, why your body is shutting down in this sense. Um, so that's how I got my initial introduction into it. And it was basically a mix of uh, medical reports, uh, studying just in school, as well as like listening to different philosophers and how, uh, I remember like the thing that really inspired me was, um, they did a brain scan on a Buddhist monk who, uh, had been in like a solitary meditation for like months and, uh, they did his brain scan compared to a person, uh, like actively peaking on acid. And their brain scans were, like, scarily similar. Um, and it's not in the sense of, like, that the drug itself is doing it, um, but rather that you are unlocking a piece of your memory or piece of your consciousness that is not normally accessible and that you can basically figure out more of yourself on a deeper level. And, like, to me, something very important is figuring out, like, to be your own person, in a sense. Figuring out what, what's important to you. So that's basically how I got my start in it. Well, you hear about that a lot with meditation. People that have gone extremely like devout mm -hmm. into that practice have said, like, I have reached states that I have felt while on psychedelics. Nirvana, in a sense. Right. So in your opinion, and because I feel it myself too, like we're addicted to dopamine sources sure we are absolutely addicted uh -huh. and i'm not even saying substance based strictly technology mm -hmm. technology is a never ending substance yeah for a uh, dopamine source and a substance sure. right as a byproduct like for instance on a very simple level one of the things i am looking forward to the most mm -hmm. is in february uh, so me and three of my buddies live in this house yep. in February. We're all going to split up and me and my buddy Joey and his girlfriend, we're going to get a spot and me or, uh, David and Springer, who you met tonight, they're going to get their own spot. Sure. It's just how life is going right now. Uh -huh. We all love living together. Mm -hmm. It's just how life is going right now. We're all going to get in our own spaces. 100%. Sure happens. And so one of the things I'm looking forward to the most about the move is me and my homie and his chick, we're going to get a three bedroom house because... They're full supporters of the pod. Obviously, this is never going to fucking stop for me. Uh -huh. So we're going to get a third bedroom and completely devoted to a studio space. Love that. I cannot fucking wait to get rid of these two bitches. <laughs> because what is the difference? If I were to turn this... They're at 50 right now. What is the difference between me turning that down to like 25 and then us staying talking as... Enter like we're entertaining each other talking sure. while there's a big LED source blasting into us yeah right like i catch myself as we're talking i'll do this number i'll like yeah looking at the light right this is how it is yeah. and then you know one of the biggest habits i'm trying i i was pretty good about it up until like i don't know what happened like four months ago where i'll like wake up and i was building myself out of the habit of waking up okay I turn off my alarm mm -hmm. okay instagram yeah yeah big time you know, it's like, no, I was, I've been getting back into that habit. And it's like, okay, instant dopamine, instant dopamine. And now, like, a big thing that I'm doing at work is I used to, because I used to, I used to share an office with two other people in our, like, office space, mm -hmm. right? And so I would have to throw a he uh, like my headphones on or an earbud in and listen to my podcasts on my phone. And so it's like, oh, well, I'm going to change the podcast. Okay, well... Maybe I should check this Maybe out. Maybe I'll check my Instagram. I'll check my Facebook. I'll text these people back. 100%. Snapchat. I'll play Tetris, whatever it is. But now at work, I'll completely put my phone down, put it away. That's what I do now. And too. then I put my, if I'm, because I sit at a desk all fucking day. Mm -hmm. So I'll throw my podcast. I have two screens up. Nobody's in my office anymore. So I'll put a podcast on, blast it, whatever, go to work. Yeah, whatever, 100%. Right. And so we're living 
in a world that is just feeding us dopamine. Yes. Uh, remove food from the equation, right? It's all technology. So, so what is what is your opinion on that? As far as like that hindering us, holding people back from being able to completely focus not only on a task, like that's one thing, right? Focusing mm-hmm. on a task, but then being able to focus on something like meditation. Whether it's a meditation, like you're sitting alone, laying down, whatever it is, doing that type of state to reach that nirvana. Sure. Or like weightlifting. Yeah. Completely focusing on the task at hand, the exactly. training you're doing, the building of your body, that type of shit. So there's a lot of aspects to it. Um, and there's two things I want to bring up. So one, the dopamine thing is like scarily, like um, similar to nicotine in a sense. Because, you know, it's a dopamine release. Um, same thing with this, but it's just so much more accessible because like like you know hitting a cigarette is like it's like a slight dopamine release where this is like i could open my phone to respond to a text and then just the dopamine just keeps coming to me and i'm like oh i've been on my phone just scrolling through instagram for an hour like it's a big um they're calling it doom scrolling now yes yes um and i mean it's terrible for you in the first place like uh not only at a uh physical level but especially mentally. Um, and then this is like also like a quick like random philosophy thing that I very much agree with, but I think it's almost impossible to reach. Is uh, There is this author from a while ago. His name is uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, if you've ever heard of him. Mm-hmm. He, uh, he wrote this book called Self-Reliance. And yeah. that... Uh, I haven't a, read it, but sure. I've, I've heard the name. Um, there's a quote from that book that uh, says, uh, society is like a wave. Like is one thing recedes, a new thing comes through. Um, And basically what he's saying is like, you are, like, society is training its employees, in a sense, just the general public, to flow with society. And that's what's totally corrupting people, in a sense. And, for example, this is that it's become such a norm for people to approach these dopamine releases, like your phone, like your computer like texting something like that is that like it is societally acceptable to continue to screw you up and when you look at it at a a biological level is that like these people are not living like a sustainable lifestyle in a sense like some people definitely can be you know go to the gym eat healthy stuff like that which I, i actually do agree in a sense with like the access to social media is that in some sense it's helping people like live a better lifestyle um introducing them to new concepts that are beneficial but you are also getting the things like for example um like you're getting ads to fast food you're getting things like that it's like oh that looks good uh stuff like that like shit that's gonna harm you and at the end of the day all it is in your brain is you're training it to be like i need this so like for example when you said like first thing you do in the morning when you look at your phone and you start scrolling it's just like, oh, I'm fulfilling my addiction to this dopamine release. So, yeah. No, it's um, the negative feedback loop. 100%. Is becoming a real issue. And honestly, I never thought I'd say this, but I'm gaining, the more I, I hear him speak, the more respect I'm gaining for Jake Paul. <laughs> no seriously dude because that guy he has a huge social media presence and he's obviously like a huge social media figure yeah but ever since he started boxing it's like he's a completely different animal oh 100 and not and, somebody i follow too much but like i've seen the change well and i bring it up because he was on his brother's podcast a while back one of the episodes he did like maybe two years ago year and a half ago and he was talking about how he tries to stay away from his phone as much as humanly possible. And he goes, yeah, the first hour and a half, the first 90 minutes of my day, I don't touch technology. I, I wake up and I walk outside and I literally touch grass. Like, he goes, I literally walk out and I ground, ground myself and I try to take in the sun. I try to, he goes, he's obviously he's fucking rich, so he has the time and the access to like he goes i walk out as close to naked as humanly possible so that i can absorb the sun so this is and a absorb and, and and like really try to be as close to a natural human as i can 
before I dive into my day yeah. of like, I've got an interview here. I've got boxing training here. I've got social media here. I, you know what I mean? Um, so this is like another thing. Uh, one of the last things I studied in college was, um, I believe it is called a uh, Pollyanna's principle. It's a psychology method of, and something that is, uh, now like with this whole social media thing is kind of affecting it. And it's basically like we can do a little experiment right here from yesterday. Tell me three good things about your day. Three pleasant things from yesterday. Mm -hmm. So yesterday was Sunday. Um, Three positive things. I worked on the podcast pretty well. I prepared the episode that dropped today. I uh, prepared the reels so I don't have to. Do, I try to do it all in one fell sure. swoop so I can post today, post tomorrow. So I did that. I made some food and prepped it in a container so I have my lunch for today. I'm going to make more food after we're done tonight so I can continue that through the week. Uh, and I went to the gym. Perfect. All right. Now, after that, name me three unpleasant things that happened yesterday. I think that sucked. I slept in way too fucking late. <laughs> I slept in way too late for sure. Uh, I slept until like fucking 1, 1 ish. Um, I let laundry build up way too much. I. Oh, uh, well, something I didn't do that bit me in the ass is I have a company gas card. I didn't check on it, so it ran out. Mm -hmm. And so that bit me, so I had to pay for my gas yesterday. That fucking cut in the budget more than I liked it, like, would have liked it too. And then I spent too much time, funny enough, scrolling on social media. And so that cut into my planning for the day. So I went to the gym a little late, couldn't spend as much time there as I wanted to. Uh, let's see what else was negative about oh, well. it. So let me, let me ask you this now. Yeah. Between recalling your positive events from yesterday and your negative, what was easier? Sunday's weird because it was kind of equal, mm -hmm. right? Because it wasn't like a work but day. But just in this moment. But in general, it was easier to recall the negative for sure. Sure. Yeah. So the thing with this now is that throughout like human history, your person is in a sense designed to find... Uh, Recall pleasurable memories, um, things that were good about your day. And I could ask you the same question of like, all right, well, recall like the best day of your life. Name me three positive things, name three negative things. Um, now, nowadays, when you have these uh, interpretations about certain things, now, like, it's different from um, looking at something like, oh, like I woke up too late. Like, that's like just something like, ah, oh, like that fucking sucks. But when it looks like something like, oh, I scrolled too much through social media, some people can see that as a pleasant thing. Some people cannot. Um, it's more that now with this in society, people are more focused on the negative and that that is really draining to mental health and things like that where it's just it's challenging to break that cycle because once you kind of do and you get away from that, life theoretically – should be more pleasant that the memories you have should be easier to recall when you are uh, doing something you enjoy rather than something not good, if that makes sense. It, it Okay, so it, it does. So in your life, what does pleasant mean to you? Um, hmm, that's a good question. Like pleasant to me would be something that, you know, brings happiness, brings something, uh, brings a highlight to your being in a sense. Um, and something you can probably learn from where unpleasant would be. Okay. So that I'll, hinders you. I'll rephrase that question. What is, what does fulfillment mean to you? Ooh. Um, so I think there is a stark difference. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Fulfillment would be to live in, in an instance that is both beneficial to yourself and beneficial to others, uh, to do things that are pleasant, even though we just <laughs> went through that, uh, to do something pleasant for yourself. Like, uh, one of the biggest things is, uh, that I kind of live by is like, I'm not going to tell it cause it's going to be a while. Uh, but like basically like you have so many things you live with, material objects, relationships with people, uh, emotions. 
But in reality, the only thing you have when you're born and when you die is yourself. So why not spend as much time improving that and helping other people improve that than focusing on the other things? How do you improve yourself? That's subjective to you. Some people could say like, oh. Well, how, do you, how do you do it? Oh, um, to me, like, like personally, the reason why I love meditation so much is because I can find more and more about for more and more about myself. And uh, I feel like the word I would use for that is gaining wisdom. And uh, to me, that would be like, you know, gaining your own wisdom, figuring out how to live life in the most pleasurable way possible um, while not creating havoc for yourself and other people around you. Well, I feel like that, I feel like there's pleasure and there's joy. Sure. Those are two very different things. Yeah. They can be, at least. So a lot of that, I would say, um, comes from like greed, in a sense, is like a big Buddhist thing. It's like getting rid of that in your life. Uh, you don't want to find, or like you don't want your pleasure to come from materialistic things. You want to find joy in being yourself in a single moment. So like, obviously like people have good and shitty days, but like, I would say like something that would be very enjoyable to me, uh, would be like, Oh, well this happened. How can I make this better for myself rather than just sitting there and right. pissed off? So making, making things, it, you, that's a perfect segue to what I was going to ask next. So making things better for yourself in modern day survival, you have to make money. 100%. And with the way things are going in this country, you have to make more money than for depending on what what social status you're at and what um, financial class you're in. It could possibly be more money. You have to make more money than is achievable at mm -hmm. points, right? Yeah. So how do you contrast that with the financial need of survival? Um, so to me, like something, uh, and it's hard is like, may not be like, you might find something you love, uh, theoretically and you might hate that job. Um, to me, it's that your work in a sense needs to be something that you can find pleasure in. Uh, and like, it's not work for you. But at the same time, like to make a certain amount of money, especially in today's world, to live a suitable lifestyle, a comfortable lifestyle, is near impossible to find. Everybody, uh, unless you are have some sort of crazy job, at least in my eyes, like you're always going to find things you hate about work. Um, so the way I see it is like you need to find something that you love depending on whatever your salary is a year. And you necessarily need to, to make it work um, other than, like, just being in debt. Like, I personally, and this is my own view, is, like, if I find joy in finding, uh, like, just, I don't know, being a car salesman or something like that. Like, you know, there's a, there's a certain amount of money I can bring in each year. And that if, as long as I'm comfortable doing that for a very long time and that that's not going to hinder me. I would rather build my lifestyle around that than be somewhere that like I'm making more money, but it's just causing me hell. Yeah. I don't know if that really answered your question. No, no. It's interesting because people, well, that's, I think it's a huge contributor to, um, divorces today mm -hmm. is even the select men that make over six figures, over a quarter million dollars a year. They're spending so much time at work that they neglect the family, and in their brain, I'm providing, but in the assuming it's a male and female marriage, male and female household, the woman, and again, this is like something you can't, I can't say, or people don't want to accept anymore, but men and women are not equal. They're not built the same. Like, they're, they're equal in importance, but they're not equal in the way they operate. Sure. And they're not equal in the way that they their needs are met. Okay. Right? And women are more emotional. They have more emotional needs than men. That's just how it is. And that's why you see a lot of these 
guys that make a ton of money, they get left because the women are like, well, I, he's never home. I'm never emotionally satisfied. And that's what leads to like, either it's just a strict divorce or infidelity or whatever it is. And so these guys, a lot of people will break their backs doing horrible jobs to provide. They end up getting like divorced and shit sure. like that. And with the, again, with the way the West is moving, you have to make a shit ton of money just to fucking survive. So a lot of this stuff I feel like comes from one is like, I feel like there's a certain satisfaction and dopamine into like providing for a family of like not uh even though if it's not like like fulfillment to you or anything like that, it's still like it's putting a toll on your body, but also like in a sense making you feel better. It's like, oh, I brought in this amount of money like this year, like let's take the family to Disneyland. Like that's helpful. Dude, I saw this video on TikTok where this va- this family went to Disneyland and did like the average shit. It's so expensive. Dude, in four days, their bill was like eight grand. Yeah, it's ridiculous. That is insane. But yet some people are like, oh, I can afford the eight grand for this one thing for my family. But yet this one weekend is not going to save your marriage. It's just like in reality screwing you over. And this is like another thing. So a question I've been thinking about for a long time is, uh, in my opinion, every single person uh shares the same biggest fear but majority don't know what it is so i'm i want to ask you what what do you think it is the biggest fear that's generally shared by most people i would say almost every single person on this planet has the same one just majority don't know it's their biggest fear i think it's i can't speak for women but I think for men, it's either living or dying without a purpose. That's part of it in a sense. But um, to me, just through what I've read and stuff, it seems to be uh, uncertainty. Just living an uncertain lifestyle. Not knowing what's going to happen when you die. What's your purpose in life? Stuff like that. And that I feel like the biggest problem now with like the Western world is uh, getting away from that whole... like. You know, so many people now have problems with anxiety, stuff like that, just because they're not bringing in enough money for their family. Their marriage is going to shit, stuff like that. And, like, you know, it's all intertwined, but in reality, it's just like, okay, what if my marriage goes to shit? What's going to happen? Like, sure, it's going to be a fucking hindrance to you. A bunch of shit's going to happen, but, like, you need to live with that uncertainty. If you can uh, manage to get rid of that from your life, um, not being afraid of what's going to happen, um, and just like do what you personally can do to help yourself and help the people around you. Like, I personally believe you'll live a much happier lifestyle. Well, that's the, that's the, that's like the core tenet of stoicism, right? Exactly. Is living, yeah, living with uncertainty, but knowing that if you lose what's important to you, you still have yourself. Yeah. You don't lose yourself in the process. Exactly. It's kind of going back to what we were saying. It's like, you know, you're born and you die with just you. I'm sure, you meet people along the way who help you, make you feel a certain way. So, but what do you what do you think of this? What do you make of like the red pill movement <sighs> online? See, that's hard. Um, and personally, I believe like sure, like uh, you can kind of do what you want, but there's also a moral landscape around human beings. Um, and that like, (sighs) to be honest with you, I'm not really sure how to answer this question. There's, I feel like a lot of different factors to it and I don't think I'm going to give a good answer to it. (laughs) Well, well, so the way I digest a lot of it is it it is the red pill movement guys like Andrew Tate Mm -hmm. and his brother. I think they are a direct answer, and quite frankly, I think they're a better answer than what, or they're a direct answer to the the hyper left, hyper feminist movement, and I think they offer a better answer than what they do. And here's why I say this, right? So the hyper left feminist movement empowers women to the point of degeneracy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Like, I think that there is a reason why a male and a female household, why, like, why a wife, and again, a, a bit of this is my own religious preference, mm-hmm. why a woman submitting to her husband isn't a bad thing. Like, why is it bad for a woman to raise a household, raise children, create a good environment that nurtures life? Sure. And it is a stable environment in which, again, life is procured, Mm -hmm. right? And then a man's job is to go out and provide the means for that to happen. Um, I'm all... And that's not to say... I am all for women having careers. Sure. I am all for women having, you know, having fulfilling careers, having jobs, going out working just as hard as men. I don't think women should be paid less. I don't think that they are any less equal in the workspace, anything like that, right? But I don't, I don't think there is a single career in the world that could outweigh being a outstanding mother. Sure, yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and so then when I look at, the, again, this is the extreme, right? When I go and I look at like the hyper-feminist movement on the left, because I think there's a stark difference between liberals and leftists. There's a stark difference, mm-hmm. right? And what the leftists are offering women today is, you're a woman, you're a boss bitch, you should go out and be your whatever your you think your best self is whatever your heart says whatever makes you feel like you have the most power but they're putting so much of that on like the sexuality of a woman mm-hmm. that it's detrimental and it and it leads to degeneracy uh this is also like somewhat like different but uh i remember in school i did this uh research this study where when it comes from a purely sexual standpoint, um, attractiveness is not as important to men, but rather like in, for example, in um, orangutans. Orangutans have a... <laughs> this is going to sound really weird. No, go ahead. No, go but, ahead. Um, the female orangutan has a very uh, more open vagina. And when they are menstruating... Um, their vagina gets more like enlarged, their clitoris gets a little more enlarged. And to the male orangutan, um, this is like the most arousing thing to them. It's like all they want is to mate with the one, like if you took like, uh, hypothetically, let's say like a very attractive orangutan and one that was like not as attractive, but the one not as attractive is menstruating. Almost all the time, the male orangutan is going to choose to mate with the menstruating one because that uh, contra- or that idea of having a higher rate of contraception is much more attractive to them. And in reality, when it comes to base humans, that is the like ideal goal: is to mate and to uh, to have a child. Um, now, what you are saying, though, when it comes to men and how, like, getting older can be more, I guess, attractive could be the word you could use, in a sense. Uh, I understand where you're coming from, but also, I think, like, I don't fully agree with the feminist movement. I think it's gotten a little radical, in a sense. Uh, but at the same time, like, the way I see it is that, like, we're all human beings. Uh, each person should have the same opportunity as the other. If you... Now, don't get me wrong. I think and I agree with that. 100%. I think both from a male and a female standpoint, maybe even more of a female standpoint, just because it's like you develop the child, you probably have the strongest connection with them. That is probably one of the single most fulfilling things you can do on the planet. Yeah, is raising your kin. Now, the other thing though is, if a woman decides they don't want to do that and live their own lifestyle, like I totally understand. Yeah, that. Do fair enough. The fuck you want. Yeah. But I feel like a lot of these women eventually I, I, now by no means am I speaking for any of them. This is just my own idea of it is that they love raising a child. At least some women do. And that once they get to the point where the child is much more independent, they realize like, well shit. 
like, sure, like I did this great thing, but also like I could have made a name for myself. I could have done so much more with my life. And I feel like that's partially where this uh, idea like rises from. Maybe, but then also like the pride is again, because we're in New Mexico, right? Hispanic culture, Spanish culture. The pride on like an 83 year old grandmother's face mm-hmm. when the whole family has come together under a, not even her house, but just a household, and she's there. And not even like a power thing, but she is like the matriarch of that family. And out of this woman came 20 to 30 different either people or connections because of her willingness to raise children. Sure. I don't know what replaces that. I think that's a very good point. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and I've seen that firsthand. Same. You know? Yeah. And I know you have too. Like, I don't, I don't know what replaces that. So... There is uh, a topic I want to talk yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Um, something that I've like done a decent amount of research, and I just think it would be fun to like argue on. Sure. Um, I feel about free will. Free will. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a funny one. So for me, a lot of it is again influenced by my religion as a Christian, right? Mm-hmm. Um. So the the and and it's also just because I don't know a whole lot about. Uh, not only the concept of a multiverse, mm-hmm. but if there is a multiverse, well, which one of me goes to heaven and which one of me goes to hell based uh, on my religion? You know what I mean? So let's say so, like multiverse is not an issue. Just you, you, you now. So I think okay, so again, and this is based on my own religion, I think God does love what he created. Uh But because of that, as I'm sure you know in romantic relationships you have, true love is not controlling. Sure. If you're forcing a woman to love you... It's not true love. It's not love. Mm -hmm. Love is a choice. And I think that... I think because of that, God gives us the ability to choose him and choose to follow that path and to believe in that credence of everything that Christianity gives, or we don't choose that. And I think that, and I no, I don't think, I know that there are quantifiably good people that are not Christian. Mm Mm-hmm. But I don't think there are genuinely bad people that are also Christian. Sure. No, sorry, sorry. There are quantifiably good people that are not Christians, mm-hmm. but I do not believe that there are bad people that are Christian. Because there are bad people that claim to be Christian, for sure. But we see not. those. Okay. The, see, tele- the televangelists. Yeah. Right? I don't know them personally, obviously. I don't know Joel Osteen. Uh-huh. That's the biggest one, right? Sure. I don't know him personally. But I can't imagine somebody like that who, like, the big thing he got in trouble for was during Katrina and then during the big, uh, it was the big hurricane that hit Texas. Oh, um, shit, I can't remember it either. Um, but he closed, his, both times he closed his doors mm-hmm. to refugees. Yep. That's not a Christian. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just not a Christian. You know what I mean? If you have the ability, it's, again, because I'm a comic book dork, Mm -hmm. with great power comes great responsibility. responsibility. Right? And if you have the means to build a multi-million dollar facility, I think God would understand if you didn't hold sermons for the next month. Mm Mm-hmm if it meant you were holding refugees. And even then, is that not a better opportunity to... I want to say, um, like, to evangelize, mm-hmm. but to present the Word of God, sure. right? Is that not a better opportunity? Okay. So when you go to free will, 
Like in, in the sense of like, hey, you're staying here. I'm not going to kick you out if you don't believe it. I'm not going to kick you out if you don't want to hear about it. But guess what? You all, like, let's say, because he has the big auditorium, right? Hey, we clear all the chairs. Everyone's in sleeping bags and cots, whatever it is here. Hey, in this other room, we're going to be holding sermons. If you want to come and sure. learn about the Word of God, go ahead. That type of shit. You know what I mean? But as far as free will goes, I think we do have free will. I think we have... I think we have choices that are on all extremes from, hey, I'm going to choose to do absolutely nothing today Mm -hmm. to I'm going to go on a mass murdering spree today. Sure. You know what I mean? I think we all have those choices. And I think with humans, we generally speaking, we have, I think, I think we do have a sense of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's taught to you. I think you have that. I think just like racism I think racism is taught to you like a deep rooted racism. You know what I mean? I'm talking like KKK racism is taught to you because you're grown up in a family that doesn't like people of color, that doesn't like gay people, Uh that's taught they're wrong and they're the other and they're lesser. I think that's taught to you. But at the same time, I think apathy is taught to you as well, Mm -hmm. right? The... The not caring for other people, sure. the, the the deep rooted like I don't hate anyone, but I don't love anyone either, and I think that is taught to you. But I think if you took a human in a normal situation, whatever normal is, mm-hmm. right, in an aggregate situation, yeah, and you leave them to their own devices, I think they'll feel horrible if they hurt somebody, right, and I think they'll feel good. If they do something good for someone or if they are loving towards somebody. Mm -hmm. Like for me, one of the now granted, I I don't I haven't spoken to this person in years and I hope they get I hope they've gotten their life together and I hope they've done well for themselves. Uh my uncle, who is married to my aunt, who I'm extremely she might as well be my mom, my aunt, Diana. Um she was married to a man that did not treat her very well at least for the back half of their marriage. They were married for 13, 15 years. Alcoholism, uh, infidelity, that kind of stuff. But that guy, as I was growing up and learning to him, one of the things that he had taught me as I was becoming a teenager into Mm -hmm. an adult is he was like, hey, this this is going to build up your confidence in general in life. Learn how to compliment people. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Not in a way that you're trying to get something out of them. Not in a way it's like to look at to like look at the good of them. Yeah. Uh not in the way that you're trying to get something financially out of them. Not in the way that you're hitting on a girl. Mm-hmm. A genuine way of saying, that's a badass shirt, dude. <laughs> yeah. Or like you see a I girl see exactly you, you see your girl in a in a coffee shop and you're like, I I love your shoes. Mm-hmm. I love the way you did your hair today. And I try to do that whether I'm in a relationship or not. I try to do that on a regular basis sure. with zero anything attached to it. Because li- the way I do it, I'll literally just be like, male or female. Hey, answer a compliment. I like it. You know, ha- I hope your day goes well. And I go back to whatever I'm doing, right? I get joy out of that mm-hmm. because I know that I just get, whether they received it as I intended or not, nine times out of 10, they do. Mm-hmm. I know that I made that day's per that day's that, that per uh, blah, 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 I can't speak <laughs> fucking dyslexia. I know that I have made that person's day objectively better, even if it's by a fraction of a percent. I've made it better. Sure. You know what I mean? We have the free will to do that. And I think with that free will, you know right and wrong. Mm-hmm. Um so to start off on my my you know, I am don't particularly consider myself religious at yeah. all. Uh, I consider myself like agnostic. Okay. Um, so, but personally, just through kind of what I've learned, uh, and at least what so far I've seen that I agree with is that like, I don't particularly think there is a free will. Interesting. Um, and the reason for that is, so there's like multiple things I can get into the scientific version of it, or I can get into the, uh, I guess like, my own ideology of it is that like when you were born, you have nothing. 
you the first thing you are when you're born is you experience being born and then after that um you basically only gain experience through the people around you right or things that happen to your own body things that are out of your control um and that every experience you have lays in your unconscious memory and that that is what influences you to make the decisions you do so like an example of that is like you were saying your uncle like is something like compliment people not in again in that sense but like like just see the good in people try to make their day is that like that experience of him telling you that must have had some sort of like profound effect on you and to where you continue to do it to this day is that if you can really think about it almost every decision you make can be brought back to experience it's not you making the decision it's rather what you experienced and i like the like a really bullshit like example I can think of this is like, I remember growing up now, is this the reason for it? I don't know. But uh, I remember growing up, my mom did not like mayo. And like, you know, when I was a kid, I was eating fucking like chicken tenders and shit like that. I wasn't eating mayo. (laughs) And I remember when I got to the age of, uh, Hey, like the burger comes with mayo or something like that. Um, I'd always be like, I don't want the mayo. Even though like, I don't think I ever tried it. <laughs> That's real shit. <laughs> like, but like, I always had this memory of my mom yeah. hating mayo. And like, obviously now I've like tried it. I eat it. But like, <laughs> I always had this recollection of like, this shit sucks. So I never did it. And it was the experience of seeing my mom not like it. Or the other, or like another thing was like, you know, and most of these experiences come from like people when you were really young of um like when you're really building your yourself is that like that's what builds you is experience like oh shit like i fucking hurt my knee the first time i rode a bike i'm not gonna ride a bike again or something like that um or like i'm always gonna be cautious of this one thing because i experienced this in a poor way now when it comes to decision making that can be to the most fundamental like something so fundamentally simple like um okay like i'm gonna decide like do i want to raise my right arm or do i want to raise my left like i have like like another bias you could have is just like well like you know i'm right-handed like i tend to do more things with my right hand so i feel more comfortable uh raising this from experience not rather that i'm it's like sure i'm making that decision but i'm not it's the there are so many underlying effects uh, that like affect that decision. So you're not particularly making it rather than your experience as a person is making it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. But again, I don't know much about how the brain works, but as far as right or left-handed decisions go, I would imagine this is how your brain is wired. So not necessarily free will, but that's just, how your brain is wired. So this is the other thing, like, like the, the scientific part I was going to yeah. bring up that where this is like kind of proving that point is um, there have been like a bunch of studies on it of uh, like one of the ones is like a, an MRI machine where they're actively scanning your brain while you are answering questions. And like one of them that is like one they've actually used is like, okay, raise one of your hands. And then you can be like, okay, like you can think about it forever long. And then it's like, all right, let's say like two seconds go by. And I'm like, okay, I raised my left one. Um, And you ask that person, why did you raise that? And you're like, because I decided to. If you look at the brain scan, as soon as that question was asked, like literally like a second after, your brain has already made the decision before you have actually made that decision to do so. So the action happens. Yes. So like, for example, it's just like, okay, raising my right hand. A certain part, uh, certain neurons will fire in my brain to tell me, like, okay, this is what you need to do. Um, or same with like the left; it just happens in different areas because you know, like, it's a totally different movement. Um, but when you look at the brain scan of it, it's the decision is already made before you decide to do so. If that makes sense, it does. Yeah. So, like, that's uh, like for example, like Sam Harris. That's one of his arguments why there is no such thing as free will is that. One, experience determines everything. And two is that, like, your brain, like, unconsciously makes these decisions before you have decided. Okay, yes, but, okay, so it's all based on experiences. So you uh, you brought up this with my uncle. 
Mm -hmm. right? Him telling me, yeah, you should do this. And I've been practicing that, do my best about it. Okay. I could also choose to say, I don't want to do that anymore. Fair. And I'm going to treat people like shit. That is my own free will to go against that. Uh Uh-huh. You know what I mean? I think that there is also a lot of willpower and there's a lot of ability in, uh, especially now that the access to information has just exploded with the internet, right? I think humans also have the ability to change the way they think Mm -hmm. and the way they operate. And because maybe they were supposed to be set on a certain life path, whether it's with addiction, um, whether it's like soft habits and the way they operate, the way they speak, the way they treat people, whatever it is, or it's actually, like I said, addictions to like substances or to, like we were talking about earlier, like with our phones and shit Mm -hmm. like that, right? Like I, I remember during the, during the pandemic, it was right when the George Floyd uh, riots broke out. Mm -hmm. That was the end of it for me. I was like, fuck this, fuck social media. I'm done. And I deleted all my apps. I delete my accounts but I just deleted all my apps. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm done with this. And I remember I deleted them from, God, like, that was like the second week of May, really like going into when I started the podcast around like September, when I started like talking about it online. Well, end of August, when in September, I started talking about it online. But I remember that time, that being a choice, right? Like the, even though it was a habit and it was something that I was going to continue in my life, I decided to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. I think that there are a multitude of choices in which we can take, but then also from a, not a philosophy perspective, but a, maybe it's a philosophy perspective. The, The idea of the human experience, you want there to be the best possible outcome. And if we're predestined on a certain path, you remove all outcomes. Mm hmm. Exactly, yeah. And what fun is that? And uh, You want there to be multiple outcomes because that means inherently, yes, there are some bad ones you can go on, but there are also some better ones that you can go on as well than one that you think is predetermined for yourself. So, like, I see, I see what you're saying. Um, the argument I would have against that is, like, you can have those decisions, but also, like, for example, it's just, like, you can close your eyes, not particularly trying to think about anything, you don't know what your next thought is going to be. Um, if you think about that. Sometimes. Not necessarily. I mean, the thing is, is that like, for example, um, if you were to just be like, okay, like we're just having this conversation. What hinders me from just being like, I hate apples. Like, just something totally right, off the... Random. Exactly. Now, the thing is, that thought will pop in your mind. And, like, it's just that from how we have experienced to interact with other people is that we don't need to uh, express that. Exactly. I'm sure, like, while we've both been sitting here, we thought about random ass shit that has nothing to do with what we're fucking talking about. Is that we have no control over what the fuck is happening in our minds, what the fuck we're doing. It's that... We have um, trained ourselves to, and just as human nature is, you've trained yourself to, you know, in some senses, like, be respectful to people. Like, don't say whatever the fuck comes into your mind. Um, Like, you know, like, I mean, an example of this. Now, this, I'm just using this example. I have no fucking idea if this is actually how it works because I'm not. But, like, Tourette's, for example. Yeah. It's like, no, this fucking thought randomly pops my mind. Like, well, Tourette's is a... Well, actually, yeah, you're totally right. I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's like a South Park. But, yeah, uh, I was going to say, Tourette's is a uh, a neurological... Disorder. Like, break. Yeah. Pretty much. Where that ability to not... The, the, the ability of impulse control and muscle control doesn't exist in a, in a certain amount of pathways and whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I'm not very educated in that yeah, either. But... Well, I just, I, I just think that free will is available to you because you can choose any decision you'd like. And again, even and as people grow up, I wouldn't say there's free will as you're being raised, maybe. But as you become an adult, I mean, you, you hear like most people say that, well, by the time that somebody gets into their 50s, certainly into their 60s, they're like set in their ways. But I think the sweet spot of life between like 
14 and yeah, 50, 55, you have that time to mold yourself, right? And you can actively choose what you want to do. Like if you have habits in your life, and I'm speaking for personal experience, if you have habits in your life, if you have addictions that you know are detrimental to your life, you can change them. You can. You can break away from them. But the idea of no free will puts you into the category of I'm only going to be in these habits because that's what's meant for me. Nothing is meant for anybody. And so this is the thing that like with that is that like experiences change. Like, you know, you could be in this habit and then you see something, you experience something where somebody is like, you know, fucked up because of it. Like, or like something really bad happened to them because of something that you share in common. Like, I don't know, like fucking smoking, like fucking being on their phone all the time, shit like that. And then that experience is like mentally you're like, okay, no, this is bad. And then that's what will lead you to that decision. That it's not necessarily a decision. It's that your brain is now realizing this is not okay. So how do you frame not having free will? What does that mean to you? Not have as a person, not having that, free will. The decisions are made for you. You don't make your own. So it's okay. So in your opinion, in your point of view of this, it's whether so somebody's life, seventy five years, right? They're alive. They're meant to be stuck in this addiction for eight years, but then something happens and they break out of it. Now, I don't think any of it is meant to be. Um, But that's a lack of free will, though, right? Things are supposed to happen the way they're happening. In a sense. um, It's more that, like, you never particularly know when when a certain life event is going to happen that could rewire your like subconscious minds into things. Well, I don't think not having free will and things happening to you are mutually are not mutually exclusive. I mean, the way I see it is as simple as that like the uh the way your brain works is that a decision is made before you make it. In the sense of like I feel a certain way about somebody. Or so I so no matter way. what decision you make, you were supposed to make that one. Yes. And see, like uh, the thing with this, like referring back to religion is that like, um, a lot of people believe like uh, you are on a certain path you're put on where that's kind of where I disagree is that like the path is not necessarily molded for you, but rather, or well, how, how can I phrase this? Is that like through experience is going to define the path that you are put on. But you choose the experiences you have not in large part, in large part, in large part you do. How would you say that? So, okay. I choose whether or not to do this podcast. I choose the guests I have on. Very exclusively choose that. I'm very selfish in that manner. Mm -hmm. I choose whether or not I'm going to make food after this. Mm -hmm. Probably going to hit the gym afterwards. I choose whether or not I go to work tomorrow. Uh I know I have to. I know it's in my best interest. But I'm choosing to do it because I want to act in my best interest most of the time. Do I make decisions that are reckless? Do I make decisions physically or emotionally that may work against my self-interest? Yes. But as a stupid human, I try to make a calculated risk, right? Sure. Like me as a person, because I don't believe myself, certainly not as much as I was between the ages of like 16 and 22, 21, I'm not nearly as self-destructive as I used to be, Mm -hmm. right? So I do my best to mitigate risk and I make my own decisions. But... If, but you, maybe it's how I digest free will or the lack of free will. I don't think you can say you have no free will, but you're not on a set path. I think those two have to work in tangent because the lack of, th- of free will means that you are on a set path regardless, sorry, regardless of what decisions you make, mm-hmm. even if, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my God, I'm not even drinking beer. Even if the decisions take you on a path like this, sure. 
if you're pre if you're predetermined to go that path, that's not free will. Mm-hmm. But if you are not on a predest a, a predetermined path, that means you do have free will because yeah. nothing is determined. Mm. So, like the way I say it is like, for example, like you said, like uh, like you choose to do this podcast, you choose to cook food, stuff like that. There are experiences and knowledge in that that are underlying. So, like, if, like you, like any any decision you make, you can basically bring it down to factuals. Is that like okay? Like I choose to cook food because one, I feel the need. I feel hungry. Uh, two, like cooking food rather than going to get food is going to be cheaper. Um, like I enjoy eating food. Like, and you have experienced that, like these certain things, to where your decision making is like I need to do this, rather than be like. Or and or it could be the other thing is like oh well like I don't like there's other facts facts in there where you don't necessarily like make that decision what's well, th- pre made for you that might be a non starter then because that's just basic survival and I think basic survival can fall into both not having free will and having free will because that's a baseline of beginning mm-hmm. right basic survival if you don't follow the 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 prerequisites for survival you die. Either way, mm-hmm. so then it doesn't matter if you have free will or not because you're dead in a week. And then, but then, like you do, like the same thing as like working out, like or like uh, like on gym science, like oh, well, like I know people who work out and like it makes them feel good. Like I've done it before, it makes me feel good. So like you have this pre, uh, like you're pre, like you aren't making decision. It's just more like okay, and your mind is just like this. This is what's going to happen. So, lack of a better term, what about fat people? In their mind and through their experience, it's not important. I mean, like, I'll, I'll say this about, like, probably, like, somebody who's overweight is, like, uh, I would say in most cases is that, like... So, can say, they change that, though? Sure. So, is that not free will? It is. Or, I mean, so, it's not free will. Because also of experience, of, because they chose to do it because they know it's important. It's and well, it finally and they and it finally caught up to them. They've experienced now that like oh because because you also see like a lot of like fat people where it's like you need to exercise or you're gonna die and they don't do it and that's you know predetermined and it's and then there's other people so like the, the, what I was gonna say is like let's say you have an overweight person it's probably pretty rare you see an overweight person whose father or mother was a bodybuilder somebody who, who right. considered so much well like, well <laughs> have you seen arnold schwarzenegger's second i kid? have i have that's just <laughs> hilarious like how the fuck is your dad an eight man Oli- eight wait, wait, time here, olympian this. is that have, so he has two sons yeah you've seen the one who's just super fucking jacked yeah and then the other one who is fucking a slob. fat yeah a slob yeah from what i've learned is that for most of his life the son who was super jacked was raised by his father and then the kid who is not looking so good was raised by his mother no shit mm-hmm. i wonder if the daughter was raised by arnold I have the, no the one that's married to chris pratt i'm not sure huh but well well that's like but even the one that was raised by his mom, he has the ability to change. Sure. And the thing is, is like, you have, it's, it's all like to me, like, and like, obviously, like, you can have a different opinion, but it's, um, you can have an experience to where that subconsciously changes in your mind and to where you suddenly feel the need that you need to get healthy. But then you are meant to have that experience that changes mm-hmm. you. Exactly. Like, what the fuck? Hey, really? I need to take a piss. That's cool. Hey, hey, dude, we almost did three hours. Oh shit, that flew by. Yeah. Oh fuck. <laughs> almost three hours right there. You wanna wrap this up? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Dude, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, no, I love this. It. Was a, it was a see, and you know, I know you're telling me a little before we started that you're a little nervous for this. Yeah. Didn't show. No, no. I will. Probably first ten minutes, I was like, oh fuck, dude, like what the fuck am I gonna talk about? <laughs> and then after that, then like you know, we start getting the flow of things. I was like. <laughs> dude it, yeah this is why i love doing it yeah, this is why awesome. I, I i obviously i love seeing you when we go out kicking it and shit but like aside from a couple of google searches not on our phones yeah, yeah. just hanging out talking shit i mean shit it's i mean all that, like the reason why i love like listening to podcasts and stuff like this and also like kind of why i like was instigating arguments in a sense is like you get to 
I'm like, okay, I'm going to fucking be this fucking asshole really quick. Yeah. But it's like, you know, you're getting the experience of other people, their mm-hmm. fucking worldviews. And like, you mm-hmm. never know when somebody's going to say something that's going to totally change your life. Yeah. So. Yeah, dude, this is, it, this is why I feel like one of the most blessed men on the planet because I get to do this. And for, I'm not questioning it. And uh, I'm very happy about it. But for whatever reason, people want to keep coming back. Yeah, no, I'd love to come back. That's awesome. Dude, I would love to have you back. <laughs> Thank you again for spending fucking three hours doing this with me. Dude, I thought that shit was like an hour. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, was a blast. Like, in my mind, I'm like, fuck, what are we going to talk about next? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the VHSs. Of course. This dude. is fucking awesome. Yeah. I will find a way to display these. Oh, yeah, Because this is fucking, especially this guy. Obviously, this is my favorite. Uh-huh. This is the shit right here. Thank you so much, dude. Um, this has been a pleasure. Oh yeah. And we're going to do this again. Let's do it, dude. We're going to do Whenever. it again. Whenever. Uh, thank you everyone for listening and watching and we'll see you next time. Yeah. Bye Love everybody. You, <laughs>